Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Professor Jeffrey Sachs, laureate of the 2022 Tan Prize in Sustainable Development, and our host, Professor Liu Zhao Han. Good morning, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to join us at the Laureate Lecture of 2022 Tan Prize in Sustainable Development. I'm Angela Liu, your MC for today's event. To begin with, we would like to invite to the stage the host of this lecture, Professor Liu Zhao Han, Academician of Academia Seneca, to give us the introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Liu. Professor Sachs, Mr. Sachs, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the laureate to the laureate lecture of the 2022 Time Prize in Sustainable Development. Professor Sachs, who is the laureate for this prize. is currently a professor in university professor in Columbia University. He received all his degrees from Harvard University in 1970s. And he taught at Harvard University for more than 20 years before he went to Columbia in 2002 as the director of the Earth Institute in Columbia. By the way, the National Central University in Taiwan, where I used to be the president, has been in the, 19, in the late 1990s collaborated, worked together with Earth Institute on issues relating to global change and sustainable development. Professor Sachs is also the president of the United Nations Sustainable Development Solution Network. SDSN, which was established under the auspices of the then UN Secretary General Ben Ki moon. Professor Sachs is known, is well recognized in the world for his sharp observation and his innovative 
ways to solve complex problems. In the 2010, 2012, in that time frame, he worked very hard to help develop, design, and adopting uh, the sustainable development goals, as well as the Paris Climate Agreement, Paris Agreement for Climate. Those two are considered as the essential pillars for the world to achieve sustainable development. And Professor Sachs played a unique role in both. Unfortunately, since the adoption of the SDG and Paris Agreement, progress has been disappointedly slow, mainly because of lack of cooperation. Lack of co cooperation within countries and among different nations. And this disappointed results are still continuing. Professor Sachs suggested that perhaps only through dialogue, meaningful dialogue, can we resolve the impasse and get collaboration, cooperation to move towards sustainable development in the world. And in this talk, Professor Sachs will propose several innovative methods for enhanced dialogue to try to resolve this impasse and lead the countries, the world, towards sustainable development. It is interesting to note that dialogue is fundamental to the teachings of the two most revered sages in Chinese history, Confucius, and Mengxiaz, Kongzi and Mengzi. We all know that the basic format of the famous analect of Confucius and the seven chapters of Mengxiaz, Lun Yu and <coughs> the basic format is dialogue. They demonstrated how dialogue can actually lead to harmony and advanced 
of human society. So let's welcome Professor Sachs for his laureate lecture on dialogue and sustainable development. Professor Sachs. Thank you very much, Professor Liu. Please take your seat. And let's now invite Professor Sachs to deliver his speech. Professor Liu, thank you so much for your wise words and for the lovely introduction and all my gratitude to the Tang Prize Foundation for uh, the award and the opportunity to share with you my thoughts this morning about sustainable development and the state of the world today. I want to start with two observations by two very uh, wise observers. One was, in a way, a, a guru of mine at Harvard University, uh, the, uh, Professor Edward Wilson, an evolutionary biologist who passed away last year. And he was a, a great thinker and a wonderful person. And he described our state of affairs in the 21st century in the following way. He said that we have entered the 21st century with our Stone Age emotions, our medieval institutions, and our godlike technologies. So for Professor Wilson, what was our deep state of affairs was the absolute incongruity of the timing of our human nature, which was formed in evolutionary time scale over tens and hundreds of thousands of years, which formed our capacities both for cooperation and for violence. Our medieval institutions, such as the Constitution of the United States, very clever in 1787, not the way I would recommend writing it today. So it is a medieval institution, and it is not up to today's challenges, unfortunately. And, of course, our godlike technologies, because we are in an age of advances of technological know-how at an unprecedented rate and probably at a still accelerating rate because of the continuing advances made possible by the computation and digital revolutions of which Taiwan is so much a part. The second observation that is related is by my favorite president during my lifetime, indeed the only one that I've really liked, I have to say, and that's President John F. Kennedy, who said in his inaugural address on January 20th, 1961, for the world is very different now. Man holds in his mortal hands the ability to end all forms of human poverty and all forms of human life. So President Kennedy, I think in one sentence, described the existential reality of our time and was pointing in the same way as Professor Wilson, which is that our technological capacity is so vast, but our institutional and human capacities so limited that at the same time we could end all forms of human poverty, but also the same technological capacity could destroy life on the planet. And of course at the time he was referring to the risk of thermonuclear war, which ironically, though he came to office completely determined 
to avert that came closest during his administration in October 1962 with the Cuban Missile Crisis. But we're in the same state today as we were in October 1962 uh, in a hot war between the US and Russia, the two largest nuclear powers. And believe me, this is a war between the US and Russia, not a proxy war even. This morning, as I watched the latest news, we had US airplanes providing intelligence for Ukrainian vessels to shoot missiles at Russian ships in the Black Sea. This is an active war in which the United States plays a direct military part, not just a supplier part. And this is how dangerous the world is. Two countries with 6,000 nuclear warheads in hot war right now. And this is what President Kennedy was warning about. Sustainable development is an idea to confront this reality. So sustainable development is an idea. It's a new idea. It has several facets that I would like to discuss. But it's an idea really that is effectively less than 40 years old. Dr. Brundtland's famous commission in 1987 brought the phrase to the public awareness. And the idea of sustainable development was adopted diplomatically at the Rio summit in 1992, where it was formally inscribed as a goal of the member states of the United Nations. Now, why did we come to the need for this? Why is the world the way that Professors Wilson and President Kennedy, Professor Wilson and President Kennedy described? I think we need to start with the nature of the world system as it is today. There is a system that connects the operations of economics, politics, geopolitics, and so forth that binds the whole world together in an interconnected, highly complex, and now very dangerous structure. And I would say that there are four key elements of the world system to keep in mind. First, it is Western dominated. And by West, I mean it is dominated by the countries of the North Atlantic region. That means the UK, the European Union, and the United States. And it is dominated by the West for a absolutely uh, um, uh, single twist of uh, world history, and that is that industrialization came first to the North Atlantic region, specifically in the workshop of James Watt in University of Glasgow in the 1770s when he added a condenser to Newcomen's steam engine and made the first modern effective steam engine. Now, China had invented the steam engine many centuries earlier, but it was Britain that brought the modern steam engine to life and then put the steam engine into uh, transport, especially rail, and then ocean steamers, and into its navy, and made a Western-led world in the 19th century. We can date the arrival of the Western-led world between 1795 and 1839. Because in 1795, King George III sent his emissary, George McCartney, to discuss opening of China with Emperor Qianlong. And Emperor Qianlong famously said, we don't really need your goods, and please stick to the port of Canton. In 1839, after the steam engine had been put onto the British naval vessels, Britain launched the war against China, the first opium war, and history was decisively changed. 
So it was British militarism that created the Western-led world. Britain was by far the most militaristic country of the 19th century, and it battered all the rest of the non-industrial world. The second fact of the world system is that it is capitalist. Capitalist does not mean free market or even market economics. It means that it operates for the benefit of private enterprises seeking profit. It's often state-led. In fact, it's a merger of state and private interests, but it is oriented towards private capital. And of course, it was the East India Company of Britain that colonized India, not the British Raj. The British Raj took over from the East India Company in 1858, but it was capitalism in its basic form, a private company heavily uh, intersected by the state because Queen Elizabeth owned shares, as did others uh, in the East India Company, but the idea was private property uh, and private capital, and that's how the world is organized till today. It has certain strong merits. It leads to a lot of human energy devoted towards uh, uh, accumulation of, of uh, wealth uh, because uh, the profit motive is extraordinarily powerful as an incentive mechanism. But it means a world based on greed fundamentally and a world in which political systems are generally oriented towards private wealth maximization. The United States runs on behalf of its private industry. The US government doesn't control industry. The US industry controls the state. And this is quite clear. It's not a radical proposition. It's a quite evident proposition, especially through campaign contributions that now total more than $10 billion each election cycle. And those are paid by the major corporate lobbies and the billionaires. So this is the second fact. It's a capitalist system. The third fact of our world system is that it is a nation state system. The real power resides at the level of the nation state, not at the global level, say with UN institutions, which I work with, which have no power at all, or at the local level. The power is at the national level because that's where the military is. That's where the security state is. And that's where the final power rests, especially with the few great powers of the world. And the fourth element of the world system is that it is a radically technology-driven system. We're in a state of non-stop technological change since James Watt and early mechanization uh, based on steam power. And it's remarkable. It could end all forms of human poverty. We could have the most glorious prosperity ever imagined, even beyond what is imagining. But we could destroy the world at the same time with the same technologies, by the way, whether it's nuclear or energy or biotechnology or others, they each have a flip side to them. And uh, we have laureates who have saved hundreds of millions or billions of people with the vaccines, but the same biotechnology can create biowarfare. And there's active biowarfare programs by countries around the world that are hidden from view, which I have seen quite a bit about in the last couple of years, and it's profoundly dangerous. So this is our state of affairs. Now, what results from this? What results is the greatest wealth that the world has ever known, the greatest longevity that the world has ever known, but three absolutely fundamental problems. Fundamental. First is that despite all of this wealth, there is persisting, profound poverty in the world. This is our most fundamental immorality. This poverty is not noticed. People live 20 or 30 years life expectancy less than in Taiwan or the United States, and it's not noticed how they die in mass numbers. Nobody in the rich world cares, virtually. 
in power, I should say. Many people care, but nobody in power cares. That's not their job. Their job is wealth and power. And I see this, and my wife sees this in our work in Africa. And a couple of days ago, there was a coup in Niger. I'll give you a technical term about that. Duh. And what I mean by duh is Niger is one of the poorest places in the world. Life expectancy is around 60 years. People die in mass numbers. Drought, hunger, poverty, lack of access to the most basic services. You wouldn't expect a coup in such places? Of course you would. That's why there are coups right across the Sahel. Nobody cares except that Niger provides uranium for France. So there will be armies all over. There will be new proxy wars in Niger, not because of the people who are completely invisible and expendable, but because of what the uranium might mean. So this is the first failing. We could end all forms of human poverty, but we don't do so. We don't even try. There isn't a glimmer in the US Congress of anybody that cares about this, just to tell you the truth. And I'm here to tell you the truth. I've been working on this for 40 years. Nobody cares. It's not their job description. Second is environmental catastrophe. Because the hundreds fold, two orders of magnitude increase of economic activity since James Watt perfected the condenser. And based on fossil fuels, where there are quantum effects of capturing infrared radiation were not understood or even conceivable in 1776, have led us to the brink of environmental catastrophe. And it's across the board catastrophe because the size of the world economy is so great at $100 trillion or more per year that we are impinging on every ecosystem, on the oceans, on the land, and of course on the climate. It's not just climate change. It's the destruction of every major biome in the world and every major fishery in the world because of the scale of the world economy and because of the technologies that are used. The scale only matters not because of the number of joules of electricity that are produced, but because it's produced with fossil fuel, because that's what creates the carbon dioxide that is warming the planet. We've now reached a planet that is warmer than at any time in the last 125,000 years since the Eemian period. We are already putting in place, inevitably, I would think, the destruction of a significant part of the West Antarctic ice sheet. And we are committing to several meters sea level rise over some time scale, whether it's dec decadal or century scale. We don't know. But my lead colleague in climate science, James Hansen, has been telling me for 20 years, 20 years consistently right, that what the IPCC, say, IPCC says, which is pretty alarm, alarmist, he says it's only a small part of the truth because it's the consensus view that is lagging behind the reality and that the situation is worse than we know and it's accelerating. So warming has gone from 0.18 degrees per decade Celsius increase to now about 0.27 degrees Celsius increase. We will breach the 1.5 degree C level shortly. The third major failing of the international system, of course, is that we are unable to sustain peace. This is a structural failing. 
in the Western mind, by the way, which is the Western mind that is based on the thousand years of European warfare, which was basically nonstop for 1,000 years, the state of war is viewed as inevitable. This is the sad truth. This is quite different from China's outlook, where for much of the last 2,000 years, there was internal peace, albeit typically always threats of invasion from the north, but still long periods of internal peace. In Europe, there was no internal peace for the period since 476 AD when the Western Roman Empire fell. After that, it was war just about all the time. And so even as we teach international relations in the US universities, it's about the inevitability of conflict. One of my, uh, uh, one of the analysts that I admire most in the United States, though I disagree with him basically, but he's a wonderful scholar and a wonderful human being, John Mearsheimer at University of Chicago entitled his most famous book, The Tragedy of Great Power Politics. So the book is based on the idea that tragedy is the natural state of affairs, that there will be war because the international system is anarchic. And I say, John, how can we settle for tragedy? He said, Jeff, that's the reality. He's very smart, but I can't settle for a field which is based on tragedy, except maybe in literature, but not in our reality. And that's where sustainable development comes in. The idea of sustainable development is a problem-solving field. It is to address those three areas and say, no, we will end poverty. We can have economic well-being and environmental sustainability. And war is not inevitable. Not only is it not inevitable, it's unthinkable. Should be unthinkable. It's, of course, by the way, not really unthinkable because it's the mainstream in the US right now, more war. Nobody talks about negotiating the end to the Ukraine war. If I say it, which I do every day, I'm called a Putin apologist. That's how bad the mindset is right now. So the idea of sustainable development is to say, no, we choose to end all forms of human poverty, not all forms of human life. It is a field with a goal. My favorite philosopher, Aristotle, believed in telos, that there should be an end purpose. And this is a field with a telos. The telos, the end purpose, is that there should be shared prosperity, environmental sustainability, and global peace, and that that is within reach. And to get there, we should understand our Stone Age emotions and what we are prone to do, but then control the worst of them. We should understand and reform our medieval institutions because we don't want to die for medieval reasons. And we should harness our technologies for the human good, not for the US military or any other military but for the human good. Is the ultimate purpose of the digital revolution to have smarter guided missiles? I don't think so. But that is the fastest area of technological advance over the last six months. Even on the battlefield in Ukraine, they're testing their new weapons. They just happen to fall on Ukrainians. 
So this field of sustainable development is three things. First, it is a set of goals, as I've just described them. So it is a goal-oriented discipline. And specifically, we can think about the globally agreed goals, 17 sustainable development goals agreed on September 25th, 2015, the Paris Agreement agreed on December 12, 2015, and the new agreement, the Kunming Montreal Biodiversity Framework, agreed under the UN Convention on Biological Diversity. These are globally agreed objectives. They are good objectives. They would save the world. Note that in the Sustainable Development Goals, SDG 16 calls for peaceful and inclusive societies. SDG 17 calls for global partnership. Incidentally, five countries, let me put it a different way, 188 member states of the UN have put forward SDG plans of action, 188. Five have not. Which five? South Sudan, Yemen, Haiti, Myanmar, and the United States of America. Notice the company, because for the US, the goal of the world is power. It is not sustainable development. And they can't even bring themselves yet to acknowledge the sustainable development goals as a national policy to this moment, eight years after they were adopted. Second, sustainable development is a field of study. It's a systems approach, but a system of systems. In other words, you have to know about the interconnections of four main systems. First, the Earth physical systems to understand the ecological, climatological, hydrological challenges. Second is the world engineered systems. We live in an engineered world. By and large, I say, thank goodness. That's why we eat, have clean water, have sanitation. Why we in the developed world, like we are, don't worry about our food or our water day by day, though Two billion people do every single day, desperately. But we don't have to because of the engineered world. We live in a world that is engineered for water, for sanitation, for road transport, for rail, for fiber. And that's the second systems world that needs to be understood, the engineered systems. The third systems are the political economic systems. And those are the systems of power and allocation of resources. Markets play a role, and brute power plays a role. And in our textbooks, we talk about markets, but not brute power, because we're not supposed to expose the darker side of capitalism. But it's a darker side very much as well. And the fourth system is the social, psychological, ethical, cultural systems. And these are the ways we think, the ways we perceive reality, and the ways that groups relate to each other other than through the power structures of politics. And sustainable development aims to interconnect those it's not easy. It's very hard to master any one area. Of course, nobody can master all of these interconnected systems. But the idea is to understand that we live in an interconnected world, a system of systems. I initiated a PhD in sustainable development at Columbia University in 2005. 
and I was asked, what's the definition of sustainable development? And I said, if you can please an advisor in the physical sciences or engineering on the one side and an advisor in the social sciences on the other side, you're in sustainable development. So the idea is two different ways of approaching the world, the material physical, the social, political, economic, and ethical, and these need to be understood in an integrated way. And I said, your PhD has to be approved by expert, subject experts in these different disciplines. And we're getting wonderful PhDs out of this on approaches of sustaining ecosystems or ending poverty in low-income settings or relations with indigenous populations or climate damages and so forth. But it is looking at the interconnectedness of the physical, the engineered, the economic, political, and social environments that is at the essence of the disciplinary studies of sustainable development. And the third aspect of sustainable development, the goals, the discipline, is the new ways of governance. So this is an action-oriented discipline. It is theory and praxis. And the practice is essential, partly because we are absolutely time-limited in what we are doing right now in several ways. First, we have run out of ecological buffer zone. We're just at the tipping points where we can have runaway environmental disaster in several ways. I don't have time to elaborate, but again, the lead climate scientist at the Earth Institute for many years, Wallace Broker, who passed away, an absolutely brilliant climatologist and oceanographer, and James Hansen, emphasized to their hundreds of colleagues, the point is the nonlinearities and the threshold effects of our climate system, whether it's the destruction of the ice sheets, the collapse of the thermal hailing circulation, the drying of the rainforests, the melting of the permafrost, we're just there right now. This becomes irreversible. Our job, as we were discussing earlier, is to be good ancestors for our descendants but we're going to leave them with a completely wrecked world unless we act now. So the time is very short. The other time scale that's very short is the nuclear threshold. The Bulletin of Atomic Scientists keeps the do doomsday clock. It is now at 90 seconds to midnight, meaning that we are closer, according to the atomic scientists, to destruction of the world than at any time since the clock started in 1947. And I can see it because the people that run my country are completely without accountability and prudence. And they are engaged in a hot war with another nuclear power in a game of chicken, which is absolutely disgusting. And this is a big problem because they don't answer phone calls either. They don't want to hear about it. The mass media don't want to hear about it. It's impolite to talk about nuclear threats. All we're told is, don't be afraid. Well, my advice is be afraid. Because we are not in control. And we are not in responsible hands, I'm afraid to say. So this is another reason why time is so short. We've been setting <coughs> the goals now since 1972 with the first Stockholm Summit, then at the Rio Summit, then in the year 2000 at the Millennium Summit, then in the year 2015. These are wonderful goals. I've been involved for 23 years in the goal making, not before that in an active way, but since the Millennium Development Goals, I love the goals, but we're not achieving them. Absolutely not achieving them. We state them, we adopt them, and then we don't 
pursue them. Let me say that there's a lot to study on this. So if there are PhD students listening in or undergraduate students listening in, solutions are based on knowledge and expertise. These are not simple subjects. I'm not arguing that it's merely a matter of ethics or good faith to solve these problems. Transforming the energy system by 2050 is a very deep technical challenge, not only a, an ethical challenge, not only a political challenge, but a technical set of challenges as well how to make a renewable energy system work, how to make nuclear power safe, how to engage a value chain for electric vehicles that can fit the scale of the world challenge, how to have low-cost energy storage, and so on and so forth. These are big technical challenges. That's what the discipline of sustainable development analyzes. But because time is short, let me close with the governance issues, because this is where our biggest challenges, in fact, lie. The world has been governed by Anglo-Saxon precepts for the last 200 years. That's a very particular corner of the world, very strange philosophically, and not such a good idea. But the British empiricist idea was let desire run strongly, but control it by markets or by political institutions. So Hobbes said, Thomas Hobbes, the British philosopher uh, of the 1600s, said, people are incorrigible in their insatiable appetites for power and glory and fame. So we need a strong central government to control them. Don't try to change people, just control them. Adam Smith came along in 1776 and said, people are driven by self-interest, but market forces and competition will be the vehicle to turn self-interest into social interest. And the system that will emerge of a self-governing marketplace is providentially going to lead to the common good. Alas, these are nice fictions, clever ideas, but not reality. Because we don't survive with leviathans like Hobbes saw, and because the free market is not a providential system, it never existed. We need government, but we need government doing the right things, not the wrong things. And government not simply a handmaiden of profit-seeking, whether it's the military-industrial complex in the United States, which basically owns and operates foreign policy of the United States right now. So look to Raytheon rather than the White House to understand the real dynamics of US foreign policy. Or whether it is uh, in any other sphere, we need government that works for the common good, not government that works for particular private interests. And governance for sustainable development is not easy. It's also technically challenging. Think about the energy transformation. Because we've already reached one point Two and will soon be perhaps this year or next year even at an anomaly of 1.4 degrees C above the pre-industrial level because of this huge hot year that we're having because of the El Nino amplifying or leading to an uh, interannual variability on top of the rising underlying trend. We urgently need to have zero carbon energy systems by mid-century. Now, that's a governance challenge. Does Taiwan have such a plan? Not at all. No plan at all. 50, 30, 20 is no plan at all. It's not even an excuse for a plan. 
The goal is to get to zero. 50% electricity from coal and th uh, from natural gas and 30 from coal is an 80% fossil fuel system for 2025. It makes no sense. It's not even an objective. It's a statement. So where is the plan? Well, your government and my government have made no plans because they're making politics. Short-term thinking. They don't want to lay out the alternatives. Should there be nuclear power here? It's been debated heatedly. OK, here's a scenario with nuclear power. Here's a scenario without nuclear power. But at least these two scenarios get to net zero by 2050. Has the government proposed such a scenario? No, not that I know of. Excuse me if I'm wrong. But I can tell you, Taiwan's not alone. The United States has no plan at all. What we have is a Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee chaired by a senator who owns two coal companies. You can't make this up. And I'm not being satirical. I'm talking about Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia. His family wealth depends on coal. His job in the Senate is to prevent any plan. But since the whole Congress is corrupt in the United States, I don't mean individual corruption, I mean the whole system is corrupt because they all depend on corporate contributions to keep their office. Even having a senator owning two coal companies in this day and age doesn't even raise an eyebrow. And recently, there was a, a, almost a sting or joke operation where I think it was Greenpeace interviewed the top lobbyist of ExxonMobil pretending to be offering a new job for this lobbyist. And so he asked the lobbyist, how do you operate? And he said, oh, it's easy. All we do is go to Senator Joe Manchin. He stops everything. And when this came out, it didn't even make news. Because the quality of governance is in a state of disrepair. It's a formalism of democracy that there is an election. That's all. Otherwise, there is no deliberation, no information, no truth telling on whether it's the war in Ukraine where the American people haven't been asked one thing or told one thing from the start. Or on a climate plan or any other area. So governance needs long-term planning. That's the starting point. Incidentally, I know it will not be so popular to say here, but I will say it. The Mainland National Development and Reform Commission, NDRC, the planning agency, does long-term planning. This is what governments need. Not to eliminate markets, of course, but to have a planning structure for public infrastructure and for regulation within which markets can operate. Governments need clear goals and instruments to achieve the goals, not just winning elections. We have none of that in the United States right now. In no areas of public policy, we have not solved one public policy problem in the United States in decades. Everything's blocked. A second part of governance that is essential is regional cooperation. No, no economy can achieve sustainable development on its own. Not an island economy, not a, a terrestrial economy. No economy can achieve sustainable development on its own. Even Mainland China, a continental scale economy, cannot achieve sustainable development on its own. It needs the wind, 
and the solar energy of the Gobi Desert, for sure. We need cooperation within regions. That is the opposite of the Cold War strategy. The most ancient strategy of empire is divide et impera, divide and conquer. The United States aims at division within regions of the world rather than helping regions to unite around common purposes. In my view, the right level of regional aggregation for East Asia is the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, or RCEP, because this brings together China, Japan, Korea, the 10 ASEAN countries, Australia, and New Zealand. And with that aggregation, you have a mix of primary energy sources that could fuel this vast central region of the world economy. Australia has so much desert, it could provide through a submarine cable vast amounts of electricity to Indonesia, as well as green hydrogen. So it should be part of the mix. We need regional cooperation at that scale. But are we getting it? No, we're getting the opposite. When I was in Tokyo a few days ago, cooperate with China on energy? Would the US even allow it? This is really the question. Of course, of course, let me say, by the way, that if the East Asian countries figured out, my, if we were united, <laughs> we would be the most dynamic, prosperous, safe, leading part of the whole world. So why are places 10,000 miles away telling us differently? That would be wisdom. Because this is a region that would absolutely lead the world in sustainable development. You have everything here to achieve it. All the technological know-how, the active markets, the high saving rates, the ability to produce low-cost infrastructure, everything is here. This place would lead the world, inspire the world, and also provide the technology for the rest of the world. So please do it. But that requires regional cooperation as a central feature. Finally, let me turn to global cooperation. We had 200 years of an anomalous Western-led world. If one looks throughout world history, temporary shifts of relative power lead to temporary advantages, which typically spill out as imperial wars that after a period of two or three hundred years run their course. The Western world dominated because of a set of technologies that were commercialized first in England, actually in Britain to be more precise, because it was in Scotland where the steam engine was really improved most dramatically. And that led to 200 years of Western and especially Anglo-Saxon-led world development. Britain ran much of the world until the early 20th century, and then two world wars ended the British Empire. The baton was passed to the United States, which imagined itself the new world leader and was in effect for some decades, but that advantage has run its course because now technology is well understood in China, it's well understood in India, it is spreading rapidly all over the world. There is no such thing anymore as a Western-led world. The only kind of world we can have peacefully is a multipolar world 
in which there is peaceful cooperation within each region and the various regions are cooperating with each other. East Asia, Central Asia, South Asia, Western Asia, Western Europe, North America, South America, Africa. That's the kind of world that we need where neighbors are making integrated energy and ecological systems, managing river sheds together, interconnecting renewable energy together, and peacefully trading and interconnecting with the rest of the world. There are two great ways to do this. One is noting that it's in everybody's self-interest to have that kind of peaceful cooperation. And the Silk Routes are the greatest historical exemplar of that over a 2,000 year period. Because trade between the Roman Empire and the Han Empire, trade uh, during Marco Polo's period, trade actually in the 15th and 16th centuries between China and the West was a boon to the whole world. And that's why I very much admire China's Belt and Road Initiative as a very positive contribution to interconnecting the world. Of course, the United States, which is not part of Eurasia, immediately said, that's a terrible pro program. And it presses the Europeans to say, that's terrible. But the Europeans and, the, and China are the two ends of the Eurasian landmass that should be interconnecting with each other. So this is one part. The second part is, as Professor Liu said, dialogue, understanding, talking with each other. This is so basic, but so much neglected. If I could say, and I know I'm running out of time, so I apologize. Just my favorite result of game theory. In The Prisoner's Dilemma, two people or two agents or two sides have a reason to cooperate, but they have an incentive to cheat. And game theory predicts, now this is Anglo-Saxon theory, predicts that both sides will cheat. If Confucius and Mencius were playing with each other, they would not cheat, I assure you. Because Confucius would say, do not do unto others what you would not have them do unto you. And they would behave like gentlemen. Ren, Li, and we would have a wonderful cooperative outcome. But in Western thought, you cheat. That's even called the equilibrium. That's a strange thing to teach our students. But here's the truth. When two people play in experimental game theory, they cooperate about half the time. Except if they're economic students, then they don't cooperate. Because they have a trained incapacity. They've learned that cheating is rational. If they are nurses, they could, they, cooperate about 90% of the time. But here's the beauty. If you let the two sides talk with each other, not to make a binding agreement, just to chat, what's called cheap talk in economics, cooperation goes above 90%. Because something is triggered in that Stone Age emotional mechanism in the amygdala linked to the prefrontal cortex that says, I can cooperate with that person. And cooperation rises to nearly complete level. Dialogue matters. So in that context, how many times have President Biden and President Putin spoken since Russia launched the special military operation on February 24th, 2022? That would be zero. Because dialogue is viewed as a bad thing in the United States. It's called appeasement. Why discuss with the other side? 
And if you take that view, you end up with Vietnam, Cambodia, Lao PDR, Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, Serbia, Libya, Ukraine. If you don't talk to the other side, you fight with the other side. This is ancient Chinese wisdom. And what I especially love about the Tang Prize and the Tang Prize Foundation is not only its vision for a better world and its interconnectedness and its championing the new discipline of sustainable development, but also urging us to look to ancient wisdom to solve our problems. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Professor Sachs. Thank you. Please take your seat. And now we would like to invite back to the stage Professor Liu to give us the conclusion. Thank you, Professor Sachs, for delivering this uh, lecture of uh, wisdom and courage. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Professor Sachs started his uh, lecture by quoting uh, Professor Wilson and President Kennedy's words, uh, essentially talking about their worry about the, the uh, uh, technology, technological capacity of the, of the world was, or still is, overwhelming the human capacity. And that's worrisome. And he continued to talk about the current crisis could be of our society, things like uh, the uh, West dominated industrial revolution leading to capitalism and then the current technology dominated whole world. And then he went on to say that maybe sustainable development is the solution. And he essentially talked to us about uh, his idea uh, a goal-oriented solution for the problem, and also a systems approach to solve the problem. And he proposed a systems approach in areas like first systematic, systematically understand the physical system, and also the engineering system. He talked about also to understand the political economic system as well as the ethical system. 
and only through the thorough understanding of these uh, four systems and the combination of the physical and engineering aspects with the social science, political, and ethical aspect, can one really have a sustainable development-based solution. And then uh, he emphasized there's a very strong component, essential component on this solution, which is new ways of governance. Governments, well, he said, government should work for the common good. Government is there to serve the people. And uh, then the, he uh, then urged the government to have long range plans. And also, he emphasized that cooperation, regional cooperation, as well as global cooperation, are so essential to solving these, all these problems. And they actually, he hoped and he urged the East Asian countries should get together to work together. And he is expecting that collaboration can really be the solution or to be our hope for the world to move toward, toward sustainable development. Thank you, Professor Sachs, for giving us some hope and urging us, urging Taiwan, East Asian countries to work together toward peace and sustainability. Thank you. Thank you very much to Professor Liu. Thank you. And thank you once again to our laureate, Professor Sachs. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes the laureate lecture for sustainable development. Thank you for joining us this morning. Please don't forget your personal belongings as you leave, and we wish you a good day. 各位来宾，第五届唐奖得奖人演讲《永续发展场》到这边圆满的告一个段落。非常感谢您的参与，也希望大家都有满满的收获。离场的时候，请记得您随身携带的物品，同时请记得归还您所借取的同步口译接收器，取回您的证件。祝福您平安顺心，谢谢。
Can they hear me? Yes, yeah, yes, yes. 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 yes.
Good morning, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to join us at the laureate lecture of the 2022 Tan Prize in Sinology. I'm Angela Liu, your MC for today's event. To begin with, we would like to invite to the stage the host of this lecture, Professor David Derwei Wang, academician of Academia Seneca, to give us the introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Professor Wang. Good morning, um, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. My name is David Wang. I teach modern Chinese and comparative literature at Harvard University. This is a, a great honor and a pleasure for me to host the lecture to be given by Professor Dame Jessica Rousen, uh, winner of the 2022 Tang Prize in Sinology. Please allow me to say a few words about the achievements of Professor Rousen. Professor Rousen is one of the most distinguished scholars in the studies of ancient China. A China that is unique, but a China that probably is not the one we used to know or we want to know. And this is a unique civilization only in the sense of a global transculturation. And Professor Rousen's scholarship has taken us to an immense territory, an immense temporality through which China interacted with some civilizations of other areas, regions, and even continents. In this sense, she has made an enormous contribution to our understanding of China in the past and China in the present. Professor Rousen is currently a professor in art history and archaeology at the University of Oxford. And she also is a winner of numerous recognitions in the world, uh, worldwide. And she is a member of the British Academy and also an honorary member of American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And in 1992, um, she renovated the Asian Gallery in British Museum. And also, she serves as uh, the first female warden at the Morton, Merton College of Oxford in 1994. And there are many other credits, which I will not summarize at this point. And I would like to say a few more words about her contribution in her field of specialties. You could tell from this slide that Professor Rousen is an author of numerous books which point to different directions of um, archaeological and art historical studies of ancient China. As I mentioned just now, her contribution lies in her hands-on and a very material-oriented research of the objects in ancient Chinese civilizations through different periods. Through her research, she has guided us to um, um, a world in which um, uh, every, various ethnicities, cultures, and regions interacted the, with um, the environment, the ecological mutations in ancient times. So the factor of, uh, of nature and the factor of humanity sort of merged and mixed with each other in her study to give us a truly uh, dynamic uh, understanding of how China, what it is now, over the past 3,000 years or even 4,000 years. And particularly, I'm a very proud to be a reader of Professor Rousen's most recent book, Life and Afterlife in Ancient China. I'm even having a copy of the book here with myself, and I definitely would like to have uh, Professor Rousen's autograph after this, today's lecture. And in this particular book, uh, Professor Rousen introduces to us 12 tombs um, from 12 regions all over China. And uh, through these um, um, uh, 
ex excavations of the tombs, she has told us one story after another about not only how objects have been represented and produced in such a way to formalize a truly um, intriguing civilization in ancient times, but also how the civilization has been developing under the effect of ecological transformations. So this kind of um, sort of interdisciplinary study of Rousen's scholarship has truly um, illuminated the way we better understand China and the world. So today, we are going to uh, listen to Professor Rousen's lecture on one of the highlights of her most recent scholarship. And the title of the um, uh, lecture is Brown's Banqueting Vessels and the Golden Belts in the Landscape of Ancient China of Today. And this is a fascinating um, lecture, and I've had the pleasure to read um, the script and um, gone over these uh, slides, and it really deals with how different cultures, how different cultures and how different na natural environments interacted with each other, and uh, generating this um, facts of transculturation. And today, we are focusing only two of such a kind of a transculturation. On the one hand, how gold was uh, introduced to, to China to become one of the most treasured symbols uh, of uh, Chinese culture. And yet, on the other hand, uh, how this gold actually is to be understood as something from the outside, from the exteriority of our understanding of Chinese civilization. On the other hand, the bronze banqueting vessels that represent the other side of uh, Professor um, Rousen's research of Chinese antiquity. And here, vessels are being uh, taken up in relation to rituals, and particularly rituals related to the uh, afterlife, the underlining, the, uh, the underworld of the Chinese humanity. So on that point, she is going to develop a, a very, very um, unique, uh, say, discovery of how China can be understood as a unique civilization as opposed to other civilizations uh, worldwide. Now, without further ado, may I have the honor to invite Professor Rousen to give her lecture. Thank you. I would like to thank, of course, Professor Wang for that wonderful introduction. He's obviously read everything I've written, and I'm quite overwhelmed by that thought. It is also a great honor to have been awarded the Tang Prize and to have my view of China brought more widely for you to listen to and to learn about. But the Tang Prize also is vitally important in spreading all sorts of important aspects of humanity's activities, and the role of China and the presence of China in our world is actually one of the most important features of today. Um, I put the gold belt along with the bronze vessels to show you that I'm actually going to talk at three levels. I'm going to move from the objects to a much deeper view of how China has formed its culture and how it relates comparatively to the world of the West. Because not only is so much of the power structure described by Professor Sachs dominated by ideas developed in the West, in fact, a lot of art history, anthropology, and the understanding of China is based on Western ideas. And I want to suggest that we should look more closely at China and see how its views and ideas are constructed. And it's typical in working in a museum or in a university to look closely at the objects, to think about how, what these 
represented and how they were made to make qualitative views about whether they're beautifully made or less effectively made, um, whether elevating on the base is intended for some particular reason. In other words, we look closely at the objects and we think of their function in the society. And then if we turn to the belt, we see something completely different, a belt of either leather or hemp through a set of gold rings. These are actual circular oval rings around the belt. And actually, it's quite impossible to see anything like this in China. So I'm going to contrast the two societies that made these two different categories of object. But I'm going to go much further and argue that we also should think about the underlying geography, the underlying environment in which these two societies were created. And I'm going to suggest that we don't do that often enough. And it's these underlying fractures across the Eurasian continent that determine not only the past, but today. So I shall show many maps. But, and this map has some benefits. Uh, I'm not very good on um, the different buttons. Um, this is China, and I'm going to call it China, though in the period in which I study, it is not China. It's a large area, a large landmass. But you can see from the vegetation that there's an enormous difference here. This is an area of very high land and also enormous deserts. And I'm going to talk a lot about the Tibetan Plateau. And then out here in the north, this is not crops. This is the taiga, the great forests of Russia leading into the tundra. So if we go to the next slide. It's not, I'm, is this close enough? Um, here you see the geography better. And one thing I would like to emphasize today, as in the past, this is East Asia's largest cropping land. This makes China exceptionally prosperous alongside everybody else. And they add to it this little, it's quite a large basin the size of England, really, um, that adds more cropping land. So China is already the dominant power through its crops. But then we're going to look at the lowest and I've marked a few sites I'm going to mention. But above all, I want you to notice this. This is something that lies between Western Asia and China. And all too often, the whole of Chinese history is compared with that of Western Asia. But there is absolutely no way to walk across this. If you have animals and population that is not acclimatized to these enormous heights, you cannot walk. So the only walking area is up here. But this huge desert, this very high land, drives people this way, across these mountains, and then this way. Now, we talk a lot about the Silk Road. We will come to the Silk Road. But actually, what is much more important is that the contact is across the steppe and through these very high mountains. And you will see why they're important as we go along. But over here, it's quite a long way to this cropping land. So we're talking about a large part of Eurasia. And it is all interlinked in the past and, to no and now. These are a few photographs showing the Great Plain. China's enormous plain. This is millet and vegetables. This is rice. And here, however, we have a desert. And there are many, many deserts included in the territory we today call China. And we also, this is quite a mild looking mountain, but it's quite far north. They're growing maize, actually, which is imported from America much later. And there are huge mountains in China. If we go back briefly, People often talk about the steps, that China has this very high land. It steps down to this region and then down here. The great danger for this region is flooding. And even every year now, we still have enormous flooding. 
But if we go back to Tibet, I want to emphasize that it is not possible to cross. And in ancient times and today, you aren't going to take a, a big hike through it. This is the edge of Tibet on the eastern end. This is the view from Sichuan province. And this is the kind of landscape you encounter, but there are many different landscapes across this high plateau. It's about four to 5,000 meters high, when we would find two and a half thousand meters quite enough. So that 5,000 is much too much for daily life as we know it. Now, this has enormous impact on the relationship today between China and the West. And this is what lies behind my argument that we must, in fact, pay attention to our everyday lives and the everyday lives with which we are educated, brought up and educated, have an enormous impact on us and that remains the case. And here you see the next fundamental ecological problem, that the two cl climates are quite different. Um, on the West, you have the, eight, the western winds from the Atlantic. On the east, you're in the Pacific monsoon. And both have serious borders. You cannot cross um, the border and still find the crops. You, if you cross those, red, those lines, you're in a much wider steppe area or mountainous deserts. And there, the livelihood is based on animals. And it's very this basis on animals is absolutely fundamental. In the West, we are quite used to an, a double livelihood, if you like, of animals and crops. If you go to the Alps, you'll have more animals. If you go to lowland England, you might find crops. Um, if you go, however, into the center of Eurasian continent, the livelihood is dependent on very, very large herds of animals and enormous mobility. Now, we talk about nomadism, but that's not the right word. These people are pastoralists who have defined regions in which they may herd their animals. And herding animals requires great skill. Breeding large numbers requires even more skill. And they are not taken in any large scale into, the, um, into this area here. This is too wet. It's too damp and too flooded and too marshy in early periods. So this area has a huge population because they're not competing for the ground with animals. And this is a completely different ecology from the one with which we're familiar in the West. And the mobility that animals confer on Western populations is missing in East Asia. So we should be quite clear that the mobility, which we call nomadism, it actually affects Europeans and Western Asian populations enormously and has done for centuries. And it has not affected China in the same way. So I just put this in a more cartoon form. Here you see Tibet. And here you see that it is the blockage between agricultural China and Western Asia and the Mediterranean. The link, there's a double link. There's the Oasis Desert Link, which we call the Silk Road, and there is the Step Road. And you can travel, I'm sorry, you can travel um, here with difficulty. It takes 2,000 years for the herded animals to be moved across the Eurasian steppe through the Altai Mountains to the lowest plateau and down here. In fact, the main herded animals do not make it into agricultural China. And however, they dominate not only Western Europe, but also large parts of Western Asia where the people are equally mobile. So we have, if you like, three areas. Um, we have the sedentary, very, very rich agricultural China. We have Western Asia with a degree of mobility and Mediterranean also. And we have the large routes across which people do move and they move at different times. But I wouldn't present it as a trade route. I will in fact argue that it's a horse route. Now I'm going to summarize a few of the stark contrasts between the West and the East. Here, you see quite different uses of metal. 
On the left, you get this beautiful cast figure of a deity made in the Mediterranean area. And here, those vessels I showed you before, these are used for the offerings of food and drink to the ancestors. And they're buried in tombs, but they're also used in everyday life. So they're completely different technical abilities. The availability of metal is different, and the technical casting system is completely different, and the purpose for which they're used is markedly different. And if we go from the figure of Poseidon to the god Amon and his clutching the figure of the ruler, Tutankhamun, between his knees, you see this constant effort to present deities and power in human form. And this is immensely different from China. China does not go for sculptures that present power in human form. What they do is to make vessels to ensure that the ancestors are continually present and provided for. And if, this, if there was one difference between the Western group west of Tibet and the Eastern group east of Tibet, I would go to this. They lead to two completely different societies, and we need, in the modern world, as Professor Sachs has said, to show respect for both systems. What results from these two belief systems is in the West, we have religious domination by individual groups, the Christians, the Jews, and Islam in the later medieval period, and they generate communities of believers who do not have to be related to each other. They are not kin-based. They are of different statuses and levels, often of different tribes. They are much more diverse, and they form a semi-egalitarian group. In China, the ancestor cult is confined to the family and the clan, and this leads to a pyramid structure in which seniority dominates. And then this seniority also dominates in localities, in village organization, in local organization, and eventually in the state. And we have to recognize these two different belief systems that inform the whole of the social structure if we are to appreciate the enormous strength of China. Because China proves itself again and again to be one of the most strong and dominant social and belief systems in the world. Because despite many incursions, many people invading China, and also the movement of beliefs on the Yellow River moving south a long way, thousands of kilometers, despite all that diversity and movement, the belief system remains dominant. Um, there are, of course, some very simple comparisons one can make of gold in the West and jade in the East, and there's plenty to say about that. I won't go into it in detail. You're looking at decorations around the necks from Britain and Ireland and from the Scythians, the Greek-influenced Scythians near the Black Sea. And here we have um, one very early jade, but the other two are quite late around the Han period, that is 200 BC. So um, we're doing very well in this comparison, but this is a quite light-hearted one. If we just look at the items, however, if we look at what lies below the ground, we see something quite different. And this is a very, very important difference. China consists here, as you see, of different geological plates. And if you ignore the plates, you fail to see that the gold is actually more concentrated in this northern plate, which is part of the Altai Mountains of Syri Siberia and of Mongolia. And this is not a gold area. So, but it's even more serious for the Chinese in the early periods that copper is not well distributed in this northern plate. So that looking for copper has to take place on the Yangtze River or occasional small amounts in the northern provinces. So this is part of the incredible industrial level skill with which China looked for resources and then used these enormous amounts of bronze that is involving copper, tin, 
How they got to the tin, none of us understand. The tin is most abundant today here in the far south. And of course, lead, which is ubiquitous and is used also with the copper and tin to a limited degree. So wherever there are mountains, there are more likely to be um, resources of metallic kind. But just, if we just remember that I said that China had the biggest um, agricultural area here in the, east, the whole of East Asia, that is not a place to find metal. And I also want to stress that China is perhaps the most successful country in creating a language that can be understood universally. Though there are many different languages and dialects in China, it has a, a script that everybody from north to south can read, and also a script of, of the distant past here on the oracle bone that um, is intelligible today. And that is quite remarkable. There's no other country in the world where the past and the different regions can be united in this way by a single script. So that this gives China a if you like, social political solidarity that is absent everywhere else. And here, if we go to the, east, to the west, here I've chosen something from the great Persian Empire, the Achaemenids, um, who in the fifth century BC wrote their script out. They used the same script, the cuneiform, but they wrote in Old Persian, Babylonian, and Elamite, and those are all pronounced in different ways, have different grammars, different um, associations, different social structures, and so um, we too, by using English and using the Phoenician-derived script, lead to enforcing a, a nation consciousness through the different languages in our different states. So China has several strengths. The great cropping area, the development of the shared belief in the power of the ancestors and this script. And in my book, as which Professor Wong has mentioned, I've shown how this makes for an enormous, um, if you like, southward movement of a single culture that creates the China we know today. Uh, so if we go to the next side, however, we see that there's a further geological issue. Um, here, we're looking at the forbidden city on the one hand, and again, we're looking at Iran. Iran is a, an extremely important country to Western Europe, and to the Greeks, it's greatly underestimated, but it shows that we, in the West, favor stone, and here, in the East, they favor a platform structure on which wood is used. And the wood is developed in a particularly clever way so that it can be prepared in a workshop, carried to the site, and put up immediately. This is part of the extraordinary technical achievement. Long before we have computers, China has a, a production system that nobody else can match, and they exploit it in their architecture. But the reason for their structure is this. Here, I've marked on a map um, a very clear lowest plateau. This is an area of extreme dusty sand that in the west is several hundred meters deep. In the east, it's more here or here. It's more like 10 meters. And in between, among these mountains, it may be as much as 30. The sand covers the ground, like you see here and you don't find stone. And so as the culture developed in the late Neolithic, we're talking 2000 BC, they were already making platforms and already placing wooden structures on platforms. So that this embodied, it set up an architectural style that lasts to now, down to the 19th century, and you will have all seen it in the Forbidden City or the temples of um, the Buddhism, and for the elites. So uh, this is something that architecture, architectural historians, archeologists almost never mention, but I think if they don't mention it, they're missing one of the most important features of China that leads to a complete difference of approach to the environment, to building, to use of resources in the West and the East. 
I could elaborate on why Taipei looks like it does, but it is partly because they have taken their architectural system from America and they've missed out the whole stone structure which led to the 18th and 19th century versions of Roman buildings, Gothic buildings, and so on. And here, a bit more on the Lois. I'm particularly fascinated by it. This is the Yellow River in the semi-north. It's not very far north. It goes completely yellow, as you can see. This is what the cropping land looks like. Some, it's now much more covered in green, but this is, if you make terraces in this Lois, this is what it looks like. And it's so stable that you can dig and live in cave houses. And from the late Neolithic, there are cave houses across this huge area. And when I talk next at the National Palace Museum, I will talk more about these exceptional tombs. China has the most important tomb culture in the world. And it's never talked about because it's not visible above ground. But this tomb goes down between 14 and 15 meters. That's the height of a three or four story house. And the lowest is completely stable when it's dug down in this way. And it remains open while the funeral is conducted. This is a tomb of the, at Anyang that is of the 1200s BC in the Royal Cemetery. This is a royal Shang tomb. And I've just put a little table on one side showing that it's probable that these deep, deep digging started with wells to get to water in an area that is extremely arid. So um, this is an unknown area. This is an area that I've been particularly interested in and have written or a, a paper which is in being reviewed at the moment about how these tombs developed. And these are the start-up of the tombs we all know much better, the great Tang tombs, the great Ming tombs, and the great Qing tombs. It is not a, not a system that stopped. It went on, and it provides the mansions, the palaces and of the elite for the afterlife. And we should never, never underestimate the importance of the afterlife and the role of the ancestors in the lives of everybody in what I would call the Chinese-speaking region, both in the past and today. It's, it's always grievously omitted. People talk about Confucianism or Buddhism. No, you should go right back to the Bronze Age and beyond before that to the Neolithic, where the provision for the afterlife is extremely complex and extremely beautifully done. Indeed, these, this is a set of banqueting vessels, and that's why I mentioned the banqueting vessels. The banqueting vessels, in some way, provide the definition of this ancestral cult in the early dynasties of the Shang and the Zhou. And they are extremely valuable in terms of metal. Nothing like this is made in the West. We could not afford in the Bronze Age to make use such quantities of metal in making such vessels. And here, too, the, the lowest is exploited. These are a couple of molds, mold fragments recovered from a site of the Shang Dynasty. And they show, the research on them show, is extremely complicated. There are lots of debates about it. And more and more, they have learned that it's the lowest that makes for this very, very fine decoration. Without the lowest, the casters, the metallurgists of the past would not have hit on something so elaborate and so finely decorated. It's this skill, this usage, is confined to the central dynastic sites. Here you can see that I've put the vessels here in the red dots. These are sites one could argue are occupied or controlled by the dynasties of the Shang down to the 11th century and then onwards through the Zhou. It, in fact, carries right on to just before the Qin dynasty in the 3rd century. So the vessels and the ancestral cult is really closely associated with this large, very prosperous cropping area. Round the edge, something else is happening. The bronze casting skills are used and known about, but they're used quite differently by very different people. 
Um, I'm not going to talk today about the South, but the South is an area of immense importance because it is, in a sense, the bank or the reservoir to which people could move when difficulties moved in from the North. There is absolutely continuous movement from the North, and therefore, over time, people move south to this very fertile, but also very, very wet area, the big Yangtze River and its tributaries. And it's in this area that quite different bronzes are found. So China is a country of great regions. And what we have to understand is how this group of people's beliefs and systems of living and government gradually indeed move south. It has much less ability to move north outside the cropping area because this is not an area where large sedentary villages can be built. So to sum up before I turn to the northern area, we've looked at um, quite a lot of, we've seen this area so far. This is where central China has been developing and it is going to move south and over time, this is the area where Europeans encountered China. So I'm not going to go into that period, but this is where the encounter with the Europeans took place and where the arguments about trade took place. I'm now going to go to the fact that this is the area across which people moved. And it's the movement of these people and the society that they created here that we need to think about as part of the geopolitical structure of ancient China and of today. We cannot ignore the fact that this area is immensely important. China has these three boundaries. It has the Tibetan boundary, which they've incorporated because the rivers are so valuable. They have this northern boundary between today, what is China and Mongolia and the Soviet Union, or no, the, the federal Russian Federation. And here they have a sea boundary which leads them to the Pacific. And those remain, those were always the boundaries, and they remain the boundaries. And this is the same picture showing you the Tibetan plateau. And here we see the problem. Here we find a group of people who have large herds, almost no trees, no cabbages, no crops. They can grow a few crops underneath the tents, if they, they live in tents, they live in yurts, and then in the summer or the spring, they raise the tents, the ground beneath the tent is soft, and they can plant crops, they plant millet, they move with their herds, and then they come back and harvest it 45 days later. So it is possible to grow crops, it is possible to have winter villages, but they're basically mobile, but they have negotiated crop group by creep, group, to see which, group, which areas each group may use for pasture. And the horses are critical. Um, the animals, the sheep and goats and the cattle, were, were domesticated in northern Mesopotamia on what is called the hilly flanks. The horses were probably domesticated in the western steppe or near Anatolia. All of them move over 2,000 years towards China as they di displace the hunters that lived there before. And this is it's very easy to look at the pictures of horses in China or to look at the tomb figures and think these are friendly. They are not. They are the tanks, the powerful weapons of their time. And riding them is an absolutely essential skill that is developed in the north, outside China. And we can, I've spent time visiting these areas. This is Mongolia. And here you see what is called a deer stone. This is a deer stone with a portrait of an individual at the top. This is his ornaments. This is a rubbing of everything on that stone. And these are deer on his clothes. And he has a belt. So first time we meet a belt. You don't need belts in China. You have a sash round hanging clothes. But here you have a belt with weapons. And the horses are essential part. Here is a burial mound, and around them are deposits of horse heads and horse hooves. This is all in Mongolia, and these are the product of rituals where the people return yearly or monthly to offer a ritual to the dead. So we're in a very different world. 
Instead of the food and drink that are offered to the ancestors in China, we're looking at a group of people with horses who offer their precious horses as offerings to the dead. So we're in a different world. And this, this world never mixes on the northern slopes, but the Chinese are extremely skillful in bringing in people into China who have horses, enabling them to defend themselves against these fierce opponents, and they convert them into members of Chinese society. And this is probably one of the aspects of China that is completely overlooked. The horses are, of course, completely connected all the way back across Eurasia. They've come across Eurasia here, and they've come and they've gone also north into Europe. And if we want to understand today's problems that Professor Sachs outlined, we have to remember it's not that we are naturally fighters. We have always had tanks, and we've always had them in the form of horses. And China has not exploited their horses in the same way because they have used them to fight the north, and the elite have never ridden horses. The elite, the kings of France and Britain, of Germany, of Hungary, have always ridden. The, in, in, the west, in the east, the elite are educated, they're great writers, they write documents, they keep records, and there's a very different social structure which we ignore. But we shouldn't ignore, of course. Here is an example of the kind of celebration of the horse in the steppe. And there are two examples of, in Kazakhstan where they've given the horses uh, the great curving horn of a, a mountain goat, an argali. And so they dress their horses like this, both as ornament and in death. And here is one from the extreme north we're going to talk about. And this is, again, a, a horse buried with all these ornaments in Kazakhstan. And this gets adopted in the borders of China. So here come the horses into China. They come as part of the chariot. And also here, the manager of the horses of the chariot wears a belt, has deer on his rear, has a strange hairstyle. He might even be riding. This is a manager of a horse, but employed in China. So China has to bring in people bring in the horses, and bring in the managers, and they bury both. But there's a problem for the horses here. The problem is this nutrition called selenium. This is the SE means selenium, it's a mineral, and it's very short supply across this area. This is a climatic and environmental problem, and this means that horses can be kept in Gansu province in the north of the Ordos region or here in Liaoning, but they cannot be well-bred where the light blue is. And it's no good hoping to breed horses here. It's far too hot, far too humid, and far too marshy. So there is a problem with horses that remains down to today. And today, um, selenium is added to salt and other um, aspects of food in China to make sure that humans don't suffer from this because otherwise they have what is called the cash in Beck disease. So this is showing you again the map question and the environment and now if we turn to the gold we see that it's in this northern area which is the alta part of Mongolia. This is Mongolia is here, the Russian Federation is here, the gold is in this area in particular. This is the Altai, and Altai is the word for gold in Mongolian. So I'm just going to show you one major site in Russia. This is north of Mongolia. It's called Arjan, and almost nobody, when I talk to a classicist in Britain, knows about Arjan, but it is the most important site where gold is used and people rode horses for the first time, probably from the 9th century BC. And this is an absolutely central site, as important as Tutankhamun, as important as Anyang in China, and it has, as you can see, a whole row of burials. These are the tombs of the local lords, and their, their, their clothes are covered in gold, and they carry a gold quiver and necklace and neck ornaments, this is a man and his spouse. And um, 
The Tuva Republic is hard to get at, and the objects from this tomb are mainly in the Tuva Republic, but it is absolutely renowned across the whole of Russia and those of us who work on the relationship between the North and China. Here are his, this is the man himself in a reconstruction wearing his belt and people who wear belts are northerners. They ride and they have their weapons hanging from their belts. So if you see a belt in China, you're looking at a northerner. Here is his belt, here's his dagger, these are the horses that are on his cap and these are the panthers that are on his clothes. So it's a whole glitter. This man is immensely wealthy. He's immensely powerful. He's got a great clan, series of clans, who offer him support and through the herding system and the enormous number of animals in his herds will be very important. And this comes to the borders of China. So I've shown you up here, Arjan, and here, Arjan is in relation to the main part of China. And now we're going to look at Yuhuang Miao, which is here. And this is the, the mountains on the edge of Beijing, north of Beijing. This is the Yen Mountains. And people who write saying it's easy to walk into China are wrong. It is not easy to walk into China. And there are these huge mountains. And this is where, to defend Beijing, they built part of the Great Wall. And now we see a burial from this region and we see for the first time in the Chinese territory the burial of horses' heads. This is not a member of the Chinese elite at all. It couldn't be. He has gold panther around his neck. He has a belt hook in an animal style. He has boars on his clothes. These are all little bronzes here, all little bronze animals like the man had in gold. And he has step weapons here, a dagger and a knife. And this is the man I showed you before. He has this dagger and knife. And the man at Yu Huang Miao on the edge of Beijing has a dagger and a knife. And they share the same form of belt. So this is the actual belt reconstructed. This is a, an example from this belt. And this is an example from the belt near Beijing. So these people near Beijing have moved across the steppe towards China. And this is an absolutely essential part of the dialogue that is going on between China and its neighbors for centuries. And it brings important technologies into China, the herding of animals, the creation of iron in particular, because the dagger is of iron, the use of horses, of course, and in due course, um, many other kinds of technology, including inlaid weapons and um, dairy products, the lot. And I'm now showing you a second example of this trend of the people in the north moving quite a long way into what we today call China. This is Gansu province. Um, here is a different place. We're here right in the west. This is the edge of the Great Wall. In the west, we've been up here. Now we're here. This whole area is enduring, suffering, as the Chinese would say, from intrusions. But it's the power of these people in the Altai Mountains, their gold and their huge holds, that is making this movement possible. So it is not a silk route. It's a horse empire that is moving towards a hugely rich, settled empire, and they interact continuously. So this is the man in that that area is one of the people buried in the cemetery near at Ma Jiayuan. And here he has, you can see, he has three belts. Um, this is the sort of belt this kind of man had in this area. We're talking quite late, the third, fourth, third century BC. He's in a catacomb. There's a particular kind of step burial. And he has a large number of chariots, brilliantly decorated, which are also um, showing the skill of these people to adapt to the Chinese area where chariots are very important still. They are riders, but they're also chariots. So we're seeing the creation of a second, if you like, polity or series of polities across from east to west. This is not a west to east. This is an east to west movement. And you see the gold belts. So these are plaques from a gold belt put together by someone who 
is one of my students who's worked particularly on the technology of, the belt, of how these different gold decorations are made, but they're part of the belts, really. And they go from Arjan, they come this way, and from Arjan here, they go west. And so most people in the west will think of the Scythians, of Ukraine, of Crimea. But we should remember that these are the strongest and most important groups of the if you like, the possible opponents of China, but also one of the sources of technology, of interaction of people and of animals. And this shows you their weapons. And again, you see the same thing, similar technologies, similar decoration. This is from Ma Jiayuan. This is actually later, but in a totally step style. Here's Arjan, and we're moving west towards the Black Sea. So this whole area, is linked together by people who share a particular way of life. And I think that's a very important feature, that we, we in the West are only too familiar with these people. They are the Huns who invaded Rome. They're the German groups who invaded um, the whole of Northern Europe. And here, China did a better job in some ways by fending them off somewhat and incorporating them within their state so that they benefited directly from their state without being taken over. The Chinese language, the Chinese ancestral sacrifices, the offerings continued. They were not interrupted by these people. They acted as contributors. They were often converted into the Chinese practices. But unlike in the West, they did not take over the states. So we see two very different reactions to these very, very powerful groups of people. And I think one should never under underestimate the mobility and the animals. We are only too willing to say that being settled based on crop farming is the most powerful group of people. I think I would always pay a lot of attention to the mobile and the people with large numbers of animals. Because with animals, when faced by famine, faced by ice, as these people often are, you can move. And that gave them great flexibility and made it possible to populate the whole of this area. This is an enormous area, much larger than China, much larger than Europe, and very, very hostile in very bad winters. And we see the way they infiltrate. This, we've met this man several times. He's from Arjan. Here is the Oxus treasure. It shows them entering Iran. Here we see a similar man, belts, boots, wonderful gold decoration. He's in Kazakhstan. And here we see a member of the Terracotta Warriors. What does that tell us? He's wearing a belt. He's got short tunics. He's wearing soft trousers. And above all, he has soft shoes. And the soft shoes tell us, like this man, and this man, and this man, that he's a rider. So the riders in the Terracotta Warriors, in the army of the Qin Emperor, were outsiders. They had been brought into China. They brought the horses as well. And they've made the Qin powerful. So this is an example of the adaptation and skill of the Qin and their background, the, the Chinese language, the, the, callig the calligraphy of the characters and of the ancestral offerings and the, the belief in the power of the family and of the ancestors that has led the dominance of that set of Chinese protocols, if you like, or Chinese beliefs, Chinese practices, and has enabled China to do different forms of adaptation of the presence and proximity of the outsiders, actually right down to the time of the Qing dynasty, who are, of course, just another member of the outsiders. The Qin also, despite being a rather Western group of people, had already adopted the offerings to the ancestors in food and drink, as here. But actually, on this piece, you see two animals. They combine features of the traditional Chinese offerings with features of the pastoral life that they knew. And this, carry, this use of these ancient vessels carries right down into the Ming and Qing here in copies which you see in ceramic, but I could produce today for you 
images of these bronzes in um, offices of the party, in, in temples, and in great palaces around China. So that the tradition of this offering to the ancestors has continued and is recognized throughout China as an essential part of their history, and we ignore it all the time. So as a Westerner, as a European, what I think is the most important thing we should do and can do is to think more deeply about what the paraphernalia is, what the objects are, what the way of life, what the belief system is of China, what unites it even down to today, and consider the power that it has given them over many millennia. So here I summarize what I've said. There is this complete division at Tibet with the ancestral beliefs, the Chinese characters, the Chinese construction system against the stone, the multiple languages of the West, and the figural sculpture of the West. And they're joined together by the people of the gold belts and by, above all, the horses. And we shouldn't romanticize the horses. The horses are the weapons of the past. They are essential to the skill of this central group. And it's a skill that, until the 19th century, was dominant in Europe and in the USA. It is not anymore. Now we are into a different technology, but it's just as dominant here. Here are the gas pipelines of the Eurasian continent, and they're moving from the Russian Federation into China. And here is one of the largest copper mines in the world, and it's in Mongolia. And that is essential for the electric cars and the electric um, system of energy for the Chinese. And this is part of their monopoly of this section. We have to remember that it's part of a long seam of copper that runs across Central Asia and to the north, but it's inaccessible in the north of China and in the central plains. They have to use this northern group. So the gold has been replaced by the copper and the horses have been replaced by the gas, but we're still in the same dialogue that we always were. And those of us who underestimated the relationship between the Russian Federation and China should think hard about this ancient gift to, um, to the world and of China's power then and now. So I end with a map again. We should always look at the map. We should remember the three boundaries. And we should remember that in order to understand how this region hangs together, we need to look at the past as well as the present, and we need to be less categorical about what will work and what will not work. We need to think about how people construct their society and how they present it to themselves, because we all present our social and our artistic life to ourselves, and we present it in churches in the West, in great tombs in the East. We think differently, and we have different priorities. And we must never think that our priorities need to override everybody else's. We need, in other words, to be balanced and think about the different roles that different people play across this huge, huge area. We belong to the far end in the West, but you here dominate in the East. I'm delighted to be here to tell you about the world that I've come to know and love. It's a difficult world but it has been a very exciting journey for me. And I hope that everybody who is younger and working in this area will t go forward and think further about the relationship of these different, different ecologies and landfalls to each other. Tibet, Xinjiang, Mongolia, Kazakhstan, they're all part of one story. They're not separate. They're joined together and you have to work with all of them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Professor Walson. Please take your seat. Thank you. And now we would like to invite back to the stage Professor Wang to give us the conclusion.
Professor Rausen started her lecture by highlighting the factors of the environment, um, such as climate, such as um, ecological and the geographical and the geological dynamics that predetermine the matrix of a civilization such as China. She then moved on to talk about um, the human factor which enact or enable the possibility of contact and the communication between people of uh, different continents, regions, areas, and the cultures and civilizations. So this is a truly a, a very lively history that we have been through over the past three or 4,000 years. Through minute details, uh, particularly details in relations to uh, in relation to objects such as a, a dagger, the patterns of a dagger, such as a gold belt, such as um, um, banquet vessels, bronze artifacts, and so on and so forth, uh, uh, Professor Rausen was able to discern the uh, very nuanced uh, communications and um, networkings among different peoples and regions and even civilizations. And therefore, as a result, she was able to tell us a truly marvelous history about not only China, but also the whole world. And this history cannot be only understood through language as we normally uh, get access to, but also through objects. So here, the material entities from ancient times to the present serve as the linkages that help us to better understand the immensity and the perplexity of Chinese civilization in particular and human civilization in general. This is a truly remarkable scholarship and only we have this one hour to learn so much from Professor Jessica Rausen. I believe um, many of you, like me, just couldn't wait to read more of her scholarship through her books and the discoveries. But on this note, we'll have to conclude our lecture today. Thank you very much, Professor Rausen, for your contribution to Chinese and the Sinological Studies. And thank you, everybody, for your being here to share this uh, very treasurable period of time with all of us in honor of uh, the Tom Price Laureate. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much to Professor Wang, and thank you once again to our laureate, Professor Rawlson. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes the laureate lecture for Sinology. Thank you for joining us this morning. Please don't forget your personal belongings as you leave, and we wish you a good day. 各位来宾，第五届唐奖得奖人演讲汉学场到这边告一个段落。非常感谢您的参与，也希望大家都有满满的收获。离场时，请记得您随身携带的物品，并且归还您所借取的同步口译接收器，取回您的证件。祝福各位平安顺心，谢谢。
七八。
Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Professor Cheryl Saunders, laureate of the 2022 Tom Prize in Rule of Law, and our host, Professor Jing Rong Ye. Good afternoon, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to join us at the Laureate Lecture of the 2022 Tum Prize in Rule of Law. I'm Angela Liu, your MC for today's event. To begin with, we would like to invite to the stage the host of this lecture, Professor Jing Rong Ye, Chair Professor of National Taiwan University, to give us the introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Ye. It is our greatest pleasure to have Professor Shaw Saunders, the 2022 Tam Prize Laureate in Rule of Law, with us today. Actually, we uh, announced the laureate last year, but we waited for this lecture for so long. Now we have the chance to listen to Shaw Saunders. He is going to talk to us about her experience and theorizing about constitutional landscape in the region and beyond. Currently, a laureate professor emeritus at University of Melbourne. Professor Saunders is also an elective fellow of Academy of Social Sciences in Australia and uh, Britain. Academy. She has been made an officer of Order of the Australia, awarded the Australia Centenary Medal and Legion of Honor of France. Professor Saunders' contribution to the rule of law started at Melbourne Law School. She actually was the first female professor at Melbourne Law School. Her consistent effort in advancing research and promoting the wellness are not only reflected in her rich publications, but also reflecting institutions and network she has established and engaged in. When speaking about institution and networking, and I want to mention that Professor Saunders was also the first female president of the International Association of Constitutional Law. That term witness her strong leadership and remarkable influence, testified by many who were, who were involved in the constitutional change across the region, including myself. Also, through her participation in the International Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistance, that is the International IDEA, she has actively provided constitutional building assistance to those who were facing the daunting challenge of constitutional reform. One important feature of Professor Saunders' work is inclusive approach she has adopted. She always believed that in order to see and analyze constitutional building, we need to look beyond the region and the country that we are in. We need to do the other country, the other region for inspiration. And particularly when we look into the rich contextual dynamics, will be able to know the real issue and priorities that we human beings are facing up. Her commitment to this discipline is so strong that she traveled to many places in many regions. 
and directly engaged in the constitutional engineering projects and related discussion. Among the region, Professor Shongdos has worked on the Asia Pacific is the region that she focus on and has been given tremendous attention to. The Asia Pacific, as we know, is unique by its diversity. Asia, with its vast population, very complicated ethnic composition, variation in historical context, rich culture, well, anything you name it. These are very, very complex. Once we look into Asia, we need to understand and a deep heart feeling that we want to understand. Not simply window dressing, or simply just mention an exotic you know, phenomena or symbols. So Professor Sondo's work has reflect, reflected a comprehensive grasp of contextual dynamics when examining the commonalities and differences of the constitutional arrangement in the region. She normally works closely with experts and scholars and really deep dive into the local context to identify key, use, key issues and priorities that people are facing up to. It therefore become a remarkable feature of her work that they reflect sufficient national ownership and at the same time, strong adherence with local context. Professor Saunders work are macro and micro at the same time. They are macro in the sense that they encompasses comparative study or constitution across region, illustrating the development of the global constitutional experiences. Her work also micro in the sense that they dedicatedly reflect a comprehensive understanding of the local needs in each constitutional building project. Professor Saunders' scholarship further laid down a solid foundation to bridge the dialogue between local values and universal perspective. As we all understand the divide between universalism and particularism when it comes to constitutional engineering in various regions. The dialogue between norms at multiple levels is crucial in the era of globalization. This further led to the phenomenon of internalization of constitution and constitutionalization of international law that goes at the same time. In either direction, in, in, in either directions, clashes and tension emerge between different sets of normative values and eventually affect the path of convergence. Well, this loop never ends, and the Constitution will continue to grow and evolve under the complicated background. Professor Saunders' lecture of today with the title, The Grand Puzzle of Comparative Constitutional Law, will lead us to explore the grand picture of comparative studies and the global constitutional dynamic the world is facing up right now. Let's welcome Professor Saunders. Thank you very much to Professor Ye, and let's now invite Professor Saunders to deliver her speech. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Ye, for that 
uh, very generous and fulsome uh, introduction. Uh, distinguished guests and colleagues, uh, I'll use this lecture today uh, to explore three interrelated but potentially consistent themes that presently characterise the field of comparative constitutional law in which I work and for which I'm very honoured by the award of the Tang Prize in the Rule of Law. Fourteen years ago, also in Taiwan, I gave a speech in which I argued that comparative constitutional law needed to evolve to take account of the constitutions of the world on a global scale to recognise the potential of what I described as the constitutional gene pool. That was and is a considerable task, given the number of states and self-governing polities, around 200, and uncertainty about the relevance of, glo of growing global interdependence. And it becomes more complex still if you accept, as I do, that comparative constitutional law concerns more than just text, or even interpretations of text. It extends also to factors that affect the way in which constitutions work in practice and to myriad often unspoken assumptions that infuse them. And these include the stories that we tell ourselves about why our constitution is binding and why we should follow it, a form of constitutional imaginary. And those of you who attended uh, Dr. Rawson's lecture this morning, we'll see there's a certain synergy uh, emerging uh, already. Fourteen years later, there's been considerable movement towards a more global comparative constitutional law. The field is rich and absorbing and inexhaustible, adding to its appeal. But it's also unsettled in ways that are at least partly attributable to the uh, continuing transition towards a more inclusive global approach. The three themes for my lecture are chosen to illustrate how and why this is so, and much more tentatively, uh, the directions in which solutions might lie. The first theme is the apparent convergence of the constitutions of the states of the world, or at least of those that aspire to a form of liberal social constitutional democracy around a broadly familiar global template. Key features of that template derived historically from Western constitutional experience. They've been around long enough to justify the label of traditional, a term that I'll use from now on. By the third decade of the 21st century, the phenomenon of convergence has become intertwined with another, which also has roots of its own, which views national constitutions as part of the international legal and political order. So I'll characterise this first theme as convergence and internationalisation. I'll suggest that it has internal inconsistencies as well as being hard to reconcile with the two themes that follow. The second theme concerns constitutional arrangements in what for convenience I will term the global south, while noting that the term itself is controversial. Common characteristics of states in this category include that they were colonised, de jure or de facto, offer contexts for constitutional governance that are very different from those in which the traditional template developed and may experience quite different constitutional outcomes, whether in consequence or not. For a period, it was su suggested that such states are, in Francis Fukuyama's terms, in the process of getting to Denmark. More recently, however, the tenor of this debate has begun to shift. A new emerging paradigm accepts that the constitutional arrangements of states in the global south are, and always may be, distinctive in some respects, uh, and that they make significant contributions in their own right to the constitutional gene pool of the world. The third theme returns the focus to states to which the features of the traditional constitutional template can be traced. For convenience, but even more loosely, I will assign these to a global north. Two quite different developments merit attention. One, which is part of the more widespread phenomenon of democratic decay, sees constitutional systems that once were, at least arguably, global role models declining in terms of both performance and reputation. The other development involves experimentation with new, more inclusive forms of democratic engagement, which might prove to be part 
of a democratic resurgence. Examples include greater use of direct democracy, growing interest in deliberative forums chosen by sortition or lot, and innovative ideas for the democratic application of advanced information technology. Early signs suggest, however, that these innovations are context dependent, more readily put to use in states that are rel relatively affluent, cohesive and small in terms of both territory and population. Now, I've been puzzling over the relationship between these themes for some time, and I welcome the incentive offered by today's lecture to explore it more carefully. Many of the ideas that I develop today are still tentative, and I welcome the views of others on them. The title of the lecture hints at the metaphor that conveys the nature of the challenge. These themes are pieces of the grand puzzle of comparative constitutional law. They don't fit together neatly, so as to give an impression of the whole. The pieces themselves are ill-formed, exacerbating the challenge. Insofar as there are solutions, they may be different in different parts of the world. The diverse Asia-Pacific region in which this lecture takes place presents a distinctive challenge of its own. Before moving to examine the themes in greater detail, let me explain why any of this matters by sketching the scope and potential uses of comparative constitutional law. I understand the field broadly to involve any insights that can be drawn from compar comparing two or more constitutional systems for any purpose. I include, perhaps controversially, the implicit comparison that we all draw with our own constitutional arrangements when attempting to understand others. I'm referring to constitutional systems deliberately to make it clear that I'm concerned not only with the written and formal constitution, but with the supporting framework of law, practice, context and belief that determine how a constitution works. And for the purposes of this lecture, I'm concerned only with national constitutions linked to states or state-type polities. I exclude constitutional arrangements below the level of the state, although these also exist and may be important. Understood in this way, comparative constitutional law is a fascinating intellectual exercise. It offers the raw material from which theoretical insights can be drawn. Much comparative constitutional literature falls into this category. But I want to focus today on four more immediately practical purposes to which comparative constitutional law can be put. Most obviously, it's a necessary tool for understanding each other, whether as neighboring states, as trading partners, or for some other reason. It's a principal source of ideas for innovation and change. Change occurs in every constitutional system, but it's urgent in transitions from authoritarianism or in post-conflict settlements for which comparative understanding can be formative if properly used. Comparative constitutional law also offers insights into the constitutional conditions of our own polities, their strengths and weaknesses, their assumptions and prejudices. And it provides the necessary foundation for the effective evolution of international law, whether through treaty, custom, or the incremental creep that accompanies the activities of many international bodies. Each of those four purposes has a critical role to play in the future of our highly complex, deeply interdependent world, rife with latent and actual conflict within and between states, and facing the urgent need for collective action to tackle existential threats, including climate change. Comparative constitutional law offers only one set of pool, tools for this purpose, but they're significant. How significant depends on how well they're deployed. The insights gained and the conclusions drawn from any comparative project need to be robust. And this in turn takes us to the first piece of the grand puzzle of comparative constitutional law. Now there are similarities and differences between all constitutional systems. Comparativists differ in the extent to which they emphasize similarity or focus on difference. Similarity is linked to the assumption of universalism, 
which underpinned the traditional understanding of comparative law as working towards the harmonization of law around a common standard. Universalism, in turn, was encouraged, encouraged by Enlightenment theories, imbued with expectations of where such standards would be found. In the complex constitutional world of the 21st century, other more fine-grained comparative approaches also are in play. But universalism remains influential, and globalization reinforces the potential for convergence that it implies. The forces for convergence in the current phase of globalization are familiar. Extraordinary advances in information technology provide instant access to information about the constitutions of the world. Intense transnational human action for a whole range of purposes provide both the opportunity and the incentive to draw on this knowledge in reshaping constitutional systems when the occasion to do so arises. And such occasions arise often. More than two thirds of the states of the world have made new constitutions over the past 30 years or significantly altered old ones. Less dramatically, but no less significantly, global constitutional knowledge also influences the evolution of constitutions in other ways through judicial interpretation or political innovation. Now these forces have influenced scholarship in ways that both build on convergence and contribute further to it. A new genre of comparative constitutional study has emerged, relying on quantitative analysis of the texts of large numbers of constitutions, drawing conclusions from it that offer new generalized insights and assume significant similarity. New theories that purport to have global application circulate readily on issues ranging from constitutional identity to the interpretive methods of constitutional courts. All of this has hastened a process of global constitutional convergence that in fact has been underway since at least the age of empire building and colonization, and of course we can look further back. So as a result, at one level at least, much of the world now shares a concept of a constitution as a written instrument that organizes all public power and draws its authority from the people in a centralized state. An instrument that chooses from a similar set of uh, options for the ways in which public power is organized, that legitimizes lawmaking through electoral democracy, that provides for independent judicial review, and that assumes the, continue, the constitutional relevance of a shared catalog of human rights standards. And co constitutional comparison is easier to this extent. So much for the case for convergence, now for the qualifications. The indicators of convergence that I've touched on so far are deceptive. The real stuff of constitutional law and practice lies below those generalities. The operation and outcomes of constitutional systems ultimately are what matter to the people affected by them. And these depend on a host of factors that are less tangible and less accessible than the constitutional text and institutional design, even when these are identical, which almost never is the case. Some factors are linked to the constitution itself, interpretation, supporting laws, legal system, constitutional theory, constitutional culture. And others concern the context in which the constitution operates and in which it must work, including geographic and population size, social and economic development, homogeneity or otherwise, and priorities for state action. Many of these factors and their impact on constitutional arrangements are challenging to grasp for comparative purposes. We can learn some things by drawing on textual similarities. Often, however, and perhaps usually, this is not enough for the implied purposes that I outlined earlier. A topical, if perhaps oversimplified example makes the point. A global survey can tell us, and it does, that there's been a rapid increase in the number of constitutions of the world that mention the environment. This is good news as far as it goes. It provides evidence of some convergence of constitutional text, 
and perhaps also of priorities and values. But how good the news is depends on other things, what the constitutional text requires, how it works, and whether it makes a difference in practice. For questions like these, more complex inquiries are needed, however difficult this may be on a global scale. Matching comparative technique to comparative purpose is one of the enduring challenges of the field. Now, superimposed on this already complex picture and with distinctive characteristics of its own is the companion idea of internationalization. And I use this as a compendious term for the expansion of the reach of international law and the deepening of its techniques for self-enforcement. There's every sign that international law will continue to develop along both these dimensions. How this occurs in practice varies between international law regimes, each of, each of which has developed its own modalities reflecting the phenomenon of fragmentation. Subject to this caveat, where the subject matter of international law is constitutional in character as in relation to rights, to take only one obvious example, it contributes to the perception of constitutional convergence. And in this situation, the converging norms draw additional moral force from the legitimacy of international law. While internationalization has implications for the constitutions of all states, it affects some states more than others in ways that parallel the de facto inequality of states in the international order. States that receive support from UN agencies in peace and or constitution making will be under greater pressure to adopt international norms in their constitutions than others. States that are dependent on international or regional financial assistance, generally or for, spe for specific purposes, will face similar pressures of this kind. And states that lack bargaining power in international investment arrangements may be obliged to accept the constitutional norms of more powerful states. In an example of the uneven impact of internationalization of a completely different kind, member states of transnational regional bodies will be far more constitutionally constrained by regional norms and processes than states that are not. The most advanced case of regional integration so far is the European Union. Not surprisingly, the EU has been the source of an extraordinary outpouring of comparative constitutional scholarship, prompted by the intriguing new constitutional questions that integration presents. But neither these answer, questions nor the answers to them apply elsewhere in the world. Regional integration is underway elsewhere as well, including in Africa and Latin America. But it takes different forms in different regions, which impact differently on the constitutions of the member states. Ironically, regionalization, which inevitably involves convergence, has added an additional source of diversity between regions, which comparative projects must take into account. And there are parts of the world that are barely regionalized at all, where this source of convergence does not apply, and the Asia-Pacific region is the principal case in point. Now, so far, this story of the spread and impact of internationalization is simply part of the larger story of constitutional convergence in our time, the depth of which is undetermined and which has patchy operation. But over the last decade or so, internationalization has been reinforced by another strand of thought, sometimes termed global constitutionalism. The central tenet of global constitutionalism is that the international order itself is developing constitutional characteristics. Proponents point, for example, to a conception of the rule of law at the international level, to institutions that seem broadly to exercise legislative, executive, and judicial functions, and to nascent mechanisms for accountability. It's not necessary for present purposes to pursue the extent to which this perception of global constitutionalism is a reality. On any view, it's a long way from the kind of constitutionalism that operates in mature constitutional democracies. Some aspects of state-based constitutionalism, including democracy itself, are unlikely ever to be achieved at the international level. 
My interest rather is in the implications of global constitutionalism for national constitutions and comparative constitutional law. On at least some accounts, global constitutionalism treats national constitutions as satellites of a global constitutional order. Again, on this account, national constitutions become a catalyst for global constitutionalism in at least two ways. First, an assumption of the convergence of national constitutions encourages the view that they can be readily subsumed beneath an overarching international constitutional umbrella. And an assumption of a different kind, that democratic responsibility at the state level has been hollowed out by globalization, is used to justify both the constitutionalization of the international order and the progressive transfer of power to it. Exactly what this means for national constitutions is not developed by these theories, which typically emanate from international or supranational legal scholarship. Nevertheless, they imply both a rationale and a procedure for the continuing convergence of national constitutions. They encourage and add legitimacy to the already extensive practice of external support to national constitution building projects, and potentially, they change the very concept of a constitution as a fundamental law for a state that depends for its form, operation, and legitimacy on the state and its people to one that draws its authority from international law. Theories of global constitutionalism, in fact, have very little purchase in constitutional or comparative constitutional law, but they draw enough encouragement from the evolution of the international order to suggest that they can't be dismissed out of hand. And I offer four examples. The claim that states have lost a degree of constitutional autonomy has some synergy with the erosion of de facto state sovereignty that undoubtedly has occurred. It never took the, street, the extreme forms initially predicted, and it's likely never to do so as long as states remain the basic building block of the world order but further changes of some kind in the role and function of states may occur. Secondly, with the benefit of hindsight, since the current set of international institutions was established in the wake of the Second World War, they have played a role in bringing states into being through decolonization and other processes. The pace has slowed, but it continues as quite different examples of Timor-Leste, uh, South Sudan and Bougainville show. Statehood has never formally required international approval of the state's constitution, but the need for international recognition has the potential to act as proxy for it. Thirdly, there are in any event famous cases in which international forces have largely, if not entirely, crafted a constitution for a state. Germany and Japan in the wake of the Second World War uh, are examples. These instances are rare, but provide a foundation for a claim that constitution making is an accepted technique of international law, and that's a quote. And finally, as Chai Hak Ham and Sung Ho Kim have persuasively argued, there's an interface of some kind with the outside world in the making of every constitution. Now, what these and similar examples suggest to me is that constitutional law, including comparative constitutional law, needs to pay much greater attention uh, to the exercise of external sovereignty by states. Uh, this is now, after all, a significant dimension of governmental decision making. Greater accountability and transparency arguably is needed for decisions of state institutions with responsibility for their peoples, but operating in an interdependent world. As matters presently stand, however, Answers to, the, to questions about the ambiguous relationship between state constitutions and external forces don't seem to me to lie in the direction suggested by global constitutionalism. The subordination of state constitutions to a global legal order is inconsistent with constitutional theory and practical realities. And it also seems normatively undesirable stripping state constitutions of the properties on which their effectiveness relies without a persuasive alternative. So to substantiate these points, 
All the theories on which the legitimacy and effect of constitutions depend are state-centered. The most familiar of these is popular sovereignty, but the same is true of other variants. There are no signs that states anywhere accept that their constitutional autonomy is formally limited by the international order in the ways in which global constitutionalism claims. If anything, there's been state pushback against de facto international inroads on constitutional autonomy in recent years. This is so even in conditions of regional integration where theories of global constitutionalism have most purchase. Brexit uh, and the emergence of theories of constitutional identity are only two of the European examples that might be given. The effective operation of constitutional government necessarily depends on state institutions, state leaders and their peoples. This is true even in states where there's been extensive international involvement during the constitution making phase. Even during this phase, all international institutions now pay at least lip service to local ownership. And once the constitution is in place, local institutions are largely on their own to make it work or to deal with its failure to do so, as the case may be. Of course, one problem with the status quo is that too many states do not serve their populations. The state itself may be weak, state institutions may have been captured by other interests, authoritarian ideologies may subordinate the public interest to other goals, and we could go on. But whatever the solution to these often wicked problems, history suggests that international pressure also has its limitations. So let me summarise the position reached at the end of this long account of the first of the themes. There has been considerable formal convergence of constitutional arrangements around the concepts and institutions that spread from the historical experience of Western states. On the other hand, the convergence lacks depth and typically is not reflected in matters of significant detail. These developments in comparative constitutional law are paralleled by strands of thought and practice in international law about the role of constitutions in the global order. And these ideas build on and further encourage assumptions of convergence around the traditional template. They have a degree of plausibility that derives from relations between states in the international order, but they also are inconsistent with the theories from which constitutions draw their status and effect and with the ways in which constitutions work in practice. Now, I'll return to uh, these issues towards the end of the lecture, but let me turn now to the second theme uh, in which internationalization appears in a different guise. This theme engages with the constitutional experiences of what is now widely called the Global South, taking over from e earlier equally unsatisfactory terms such as the third world or the developing world. The ambit of the global south for constitutional purposes is vague, but to generalize it covers Africa, much of Asia and Oceania, the Middle East and at least parts of Latin America. Self-evidently, despite the label, the global south is not homogeneous. Consider, for example, the multiple differences with constitutional significance between Kenya, Sri Lanka, Thailand and Fiji. States in the Global South share, share one or more of the following features. They once were colonised and are still dealing with the consequences. They have adapted the institutional forms of the traditional constitutional template to their own distinctive historical and contemporary conditions. And they lack global economic and political clout, making them vulnerable to international pressures with constitutional effects. Until recently, there was a tendency in comparative constitutional law uh, to focus comparative analysis around the legal experiences of a small number of states deemed to be leaders in the field from which the so-called constitutional canon was drawn. At the core of this group is and was the United States, the United Kingdom, France and Germany, Germany the progenitors of so many of the ideas and institutions that dominate global constitutional discourse and practice. But these states hardly reflect the constitutional experiences of the bulk of the world. 
As constitutional comparison on a global scale became both more pressing and more feasible, there was mounting criticism of the limited ambition of the discipline. As a result, the range of comparative cases widened to include, for example, South Africa, India, and Colombia. Comparative scholars from other countries entered the field, and studies of constitutional phenomena on a more global scale began to take place with constitutional courts a frequent focus. Initially, however, much of this work continued to rely on the traditional constitutional template as the benchmark for analysis. The more recent emergence of the global south as a theme in comparative constitutional law is different in kind. To paraphrase one recent and influential contribution to the field, it demands comparative scholarship from the perspective of the global south, not only for the consumption of the global south or with scholars from the global south. In other words, it treats the constitutional experiences of states in the global south as objects of comparative interest in their own right. One rationale for distinguishing the global south in this way lies in context broadly conceived. The traditional constitutional template developed and evolved in the context of particular conditions. These included strong centralized states, a homogenous people that could be said to constitute a demos, and historical experiences that contribute to, to a constitutional culture that supported the template in form and operation. But the contexts in which constitutions operate in much of the global south inevitably differ in ways that may impact on the constitutional choices that are made. Some differences are conceptual, including, for example, lessons drawn from history, attitudes to law, the impacts of religion or culture, and some are practical, shaped by the factors I mentioned earlier, such as population and geographic size and economic conditions. Accommodating the constitutional arrangements of the Global South in context affects comparative constitutional law in one or all of three ways. On any view, it requires attention to be paid to the form and operation of constitutional systems in the Global South as an integral part of global constitutional experience. Secondly, constitutional arrangements that seem likely to be enduring rather than transitional need inclusion and analysis on that basis. And the third point follows. The constitutional experiences of the Global South need to be accepted as potentially a source of new ideas that are not necessarily context dependent, which may have application, useful application elsewhere in the world. With hindsight, this process is already taking place. Examples include, uh, for example, the recent absorption into global constitutional discourse of ideas about implied limits on constitutional amendments, uh, judicial review of social and economic rights, and so on. I suggested earlier that the first theme I explored in this lecture of convergence and internationalization is unstable for reasons related to its internal contradictions. This theme is unstable too, but for different reasons. Emphasis on the global south as a contributor to global constitutional experience and not merely a recipient of it is relatively new. It brings methodologies into play that are underdeveloped. Uh, one is the need to better understand the role and nature of culture in comparative constitutional law. And the theme is unstable also because even if, if it becomes established in the terms in which I described it, there are still open questions about where key parameters will be set. And setting the parameters are important because there are risks to be avoided. The risks lie in the potential for abuse of this approach to the constitutional systems of the global south. The idea that states have particular histories, contexts and cultures uh, that affect their constitutional arrangements is patently correct but it's susceptible to manipulation by cynical leaders or other forces seeking to consolidate their own power. The Asian values debate of the 1990s offered an example, and the risks have magnified since on a global scale with the emergence of negative forms of nationalism, further fueled by populism, and leading to claims about constitutional identity that favor authoritarianism. 
Steering around these shoals uh, it will be no easy task. And it also needs to avoid the neo-colonialism of two sets of assumptions. One is that the human values that traditional constitutionalism seeks to promote, promote are not suited to the global south. That's the Asian values discourse. And the other is that the traditional constitutional template is the only form through which those values can be achieved. At least one of these traps can be avoided readily enough. The whole purpose of the southern turn in comparative constitutional law is to draw on the constitutional experiences of the global south in the 21st century. It's not a license to return to an often mythical, uh, glorious past. On the contrary, the constitutional experience of every state in the 21st century is the product of everything that's gone before. This may include enduring influences from systems of government stretching back over centuries, but it also includes colonialism and decolonization and their aftermath, together with the population movements involved. And it includes the global spread of aspirations to capture the benefits associated with the traditional constitutional template, including popular government, security and stability, human dignity and freedom, and a rule of law. This broad guidance aside, debate is only just beginning about where and by whom the parameters should be drawn so as to accommodate constitutional realities in the global south. But the potential gains for the practical applications of comparative constitutional law are tantalizing. In particular, it's possible, although by no means certain, that a more contextual and less prescriptive focus on constitutional challenges in the global south would lead to outcomes that work better for their peoples. My third theme, which I will deal with much more speedily, uh, returns to states with established and apparently stable constitutional arrangements. In the past, these states have provided benchmarks and presented as role models for others seeking the benefits of constitutional democracy. And these also are the states from which until recently uh, much scholarship uh, tended to emanate. Like much of the rest of the world, the constitutional arrangements of these states have shown signs of deterioration in recent years. Even without turning to what seem obvious examples of democratic decay, constitutional systems look a bit tired. Symptoms include the following, declining membership of political parties, widespread disengagement from traditional politics, the expansion of executive authority, over-reliance on courts to protect constitutional values, putting their independence and expertise at risk, at risk deepening polarisation within communities, sometimes driven by identity politics and sometimes by epidemics of fake news, and suspicion of state and other public institutions fueling privatisation and the dominance of private economic over public interests. These developments have negative implications for what I've been describing as the traditional constitutional template and its global currency. Most obviously, the decline in the legitimacy and performance of constitutional institutions in sections of the global north raises questions about the attraction of the model around which convergence historically has occurred. And this in turn has implications for the geopolitical competition between democratic and authoritarian constitutional systems. Constitutional competition has been a reality for some time, but now is more marked than at any time since the Cold War. There's also a potentially more positive story, however. In parallel with symptoms of constitutional deterioration are new initiatives that could play a role in democratic resurgence. Their collective effect is to include a wider and different range of citizens in active public decision-making than typically occurs in a representative democracy. And I mentioned three such initiatives in particular. One is greater rec recourse to the mechanisms of direct democracy through referendum or plebiscite. Another is the growing use of deliberative gatherings of diverse citizens uh, to consider and seek consensus on contested issues. These have a variety of names, but citizens' assembly is common. And a third proposal, still on the drawing board, is to use technology to enable citizens to participate directly 
in public decision-making processes in what Helene Landemore has termed open democracy. What we may be seeing here is evolution of the traditional forms of representative democracy. Equally, however, we may not. This theme is unstable as well. Many publics are still in a developmental stage and the use of technology in the way that Landemore has suggested is untested. All of these techniques are vulnerable in an age of polarization fueled by the global spread of fake news. And the relationship between each of them and the form and operation of traditional democracy is unclear. If, as seems more likely, they are used to complement representative democracy, the traditional representative institutions and processes have a lot of adapting to do. But if they seek to replace representative democracy, in, whole, in part or in whole, the upheaval will be greater still and will certainly be resisted. A theoretical debate about the respective merits of election and sortition already is underway. Even if these initiatives become established, they may not have global application. Much of this experimentation is taking place in the global north and some of it in relatively small and homogeneous states in the global north. By their literature, by their nature, these particular institutions and processes seem less suited to larger states and in particular to states that are less affluent and more divided. So for the moment, they look like offering new points of difference between states in the global north and elsewhere. So now let me conclude. We live in a time when comparative constitutional law on a global scale is a necessity and gradually becoming a reality. But the field continues to face challenges. Some stem from its earlier, more limited parameters, and some are new. In this lecture, I've packaged three sets of these challenges as themes or puzzle pieces that collectively contribute to a grand picture of global comparative constitutional law. Each of those three themes presently is developing largely in isolation from the others, and each is itself in a state of flux. On one view of possible outcomes indicated by current conditions, the themes could be reconciled through greater recognition of the relevance of constitutional context, acceptance of the reality and value of difference, and openness to the continuing evolution of constitutional arrangements. But even on that view, reconciliation may look different in different regions of the world. And these outcomes are unpredictable, at least partly dependent on factors well beyond constitutional law. Running through all these themes is a tension between transnational standards and the relevance of local ownership and difference. This is an old tension, given new life by the expansion of the international sphere. Resolution of the tension to ask who should do what, why and how is a key issue for the future of both constitutional and international law. There presently are no definitive answers. Oddly, there isn't even much debate. There is an opportunity for progress here. At the moment, the relationship between constitutional and international law is treated by both as a zero-sum game. Constitutional lawyers assume state sovereignty, largely ignoring both the significance of the exercise of external sovereignty and the implications of the need for collective action in the global common good for the responsibilities of state actors. International lawyers, on the other hand, envisage a continued exponential growth of international law with assumed hierarchical superiority vis-a-vis -vis state law while ignoring the dependence of international law on effective state action within the framework of a working constitution. There's a need for productive dialogue between these two different and influential legal worldviews, even if in the short term, the outcome is no more than better informed and respectful coexistence uh, in conscious acceptance of pluralism. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to our laureate, Professor Saunders. And now we would like to invite back to the stage Professor Ye to give us the conclusion.
Thank you, Shou. Professor Shou Song has provided, was, provided us with three themes. Number one is internal, internalization and also convergence of the constitutional law. And after that, she kind of evolved the, th the theory into the global south and the global north. Well, these three themes, as we understand it today, actually cut across today, yesterday, and tomorrow. These three themes actually could serve as a benchmark to see the evolution of constitutionalism, starting from Magna Carta, the integration and disintegration of Europe, the independence of the United States, and also the dynamic development of Asia, South America, Africa. You know, if you look into the, the, the a human civilization, it's intriguing to see the role of constitution. The role of constitutionalism at play that affect our life and that affect our destiny that we are having today. So that three themes serve as a tool to understand how we got from there to here. But more importantly, it serves as a very important tool to understand what we are confronting today. Not only in Taiwan, in Asia, in China, in Europe, in Africa. Let me just mention a few examples. Our neighbor, Thailand, are having trouble in picking up a premier, even after a very kind of clear election. There's some political party who you know, won the election, but still, because of the rules, constitutional rules that make, make them puzzled, and even caged to find a solution. In Europe, that could you know, be part of the global north that Professor Saunders was talking about. In Poland, in Hungary, you have that kind of democratic backsliding concern, and also the political intervention or limitation of judicial powers in the name of judicial reform. And guess what? The same thing happened recently in, in Israel also. People took it to the street. For what reason? For judicial reform. They worry that liberal constitutionalism may be at stake. Lots of happenings has been going on, not only in Taiwan, in Asia, or in Europe, but actually in everywhere. How are we going to analyze this kind of dynamic development? Shaw's three themes help us have a deeper understanding. But more importantly, I would argue, and as I learned from the lecture, this, has, this three theme has forward-looking significance as we are living in a world of uncertainties. Technologically, politically, even militarily, you name it, or morally. So what is going to happen in Asia, in Europe, after Brexit, EU uh, you know, is facing some problem. And notwithstanding you know, recent development in the way of EU directives and you know, lots of legal establishment. But there are problems. In the United States, of course, there are problems. I heard from my American 
constitutional law professor that saying that over the last couple of years, the wilderness United States has never been so divided, and he never worries so much. Well, how about in Asia? Of course, we did not pinpoint a very important big force in Asia, that is China. We did not do that in the constitutional discourse. But China is there with that kind of very special kind of constitutional governance. And we, Taiwan, just so close to it. How are we going to deal with it? I mean, in the future, normally we will say, this is Taiwan's destiny. What will be our future of Taiwan? But it is a global issue. It's not only a regional issue. So how are we going to see this kind of development from the perspective of constitutional governance? Professor Saunders' theme, three themes, provided us with some guidance. I'm not going to kind of make a conclusion, and Professor Saunders would have her own view on it, and particularly with that powerful analytical structure, I think those of us could benefit quite a bit and continue to explore into those fronts. And I was inspired by that kind of framework and rich you know, analysis and kind of length and depth of that. And I think in the future, we have lots of issues to talk about. But it takes awareness, awareness of the government in the world, awareness of the citizens in the world, awareness of the business circle in the world, to understand the importance of constitutional governance. Constitutional governance often, often work against short-term gain short-term gain by politicians, by political parties, by interest group. When it comes to constitutional building, lots of us may have a view that you are making trouble. Why bother talking about this? You are bringing up instabilities, argument, debate, uncertainties. But try to consider some of the situation, which is quite phenomenal in some way, that the society is so divided. There are even intra-conflicts. Conflicts not only in the way of political competition through democratic way, but military conflicts, or in between. A society or country or region may run into that kind of divide, blocking lots of reasonable development, creating lots of danger and risk to humanity. Do we need to look into the governing structure of our society and see some improvements. Well, it's hard to say improvements. Some people may disagree about that. But should we talk about that? Should we begin to engage in some of the deliberations, sharing, sharing the views, sharing the mindset, formulating priorities for reform. And that's why I see what Professor Saunders has been working on. It's so critical. Let me begin by the first theme and have some 
adding to that, and I, I found this is really important. The first one, convergence and inter internationalization and complexity of laws has been elaborated by Professor Saunders. But we need to know we are living in a multi-level governance with different set of norms. They need coordination. In any given country, you do trade with others. You have human flow. You have information flow. We are in this global village, one way or the other. So those sets of forms in different levels are going to collide with each other. Once you cannot solve that out, you are creating lots of unnecessary conflicts and barriers to human engagement. So integration and disintegration, maybe in the form of institution, but maybe in the form of norms. And this is very important. As we see into the dynamics, it's not a clear picture. Actually, it happened in various ways. And the global south, as we heard from Shaw, uh, Professor Saunders, he mentioned about a very typical debate that is Asian value. As if South should be treated differently. But look into the context, you find that even the Asian value debate is not about the governance, it's about who is talking. I mean, the national leader is talking. All the people are talking. It may be defined simply by authoritarian ruler, rulers. Does they have social support? Does they have solid cultural basis? So that brings about how we see global south. Well, the south and north dichotomy could serve some function, but it may serve counter significance. Some people may take it as a way to shield, to shield our connection or our comparison with others. It was that kind of awareness that is global convergence, blessing of liberal constitutionalism while celebrating or honoring particularism in special context that will honor us to move, to march forward. Global South, are, global North are also facing tremendous problems. But it is not global South celebration. It's global South suffer. Because it's so connected. So I want to echo Professor Saunders, that divide, Global South and Global North, actually is not a clear line separating two interests. Rather, it's a tool for us to march together and recognize that we need to talk. Let me conclude by saying something that I used to say before while we are dealing with the debate about universalism and particularism one way or the other, I always found that we have an excluded middle. That middle, is, that middle of discourse is squeezed, squeezed by both sides. Some argue that everything is universal, so you need to follow the rule. Some argue that we should be different, try to maximize particularism. How about the middle ground for our discourse from global scale? And I would say, Professor Saunders, to her very insightful presentation, has enriched the middle ground that I have been advocating with that. Thank you, Professor Saunders. And ladies and gentlemen, please join me. Give a biggest applause to Professor Saunders for her insightful lecture.
Thank you once again you so to much. our laureate, Professor Saunders, and thank you to Professor Ye. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes the laureate lecture for the rule of law. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Please don't forget your personal belongings as you leave, and we wish you a good day. 各位来宾，第五届唐奖得奖人演讲法治场到这边圆满告一个段落。非常感谢您的参与，希望大家都有满满的收获。离场的时候，请记得您随身携带的物品，并且归还您所借取的同步口译接收器，取回您的证件。祝福大家平安顺心，谢谢。
Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to the laureates of the 2022 Tan Prize in Biopharmaceutical Science, Professor Catalin Carrico, Professor Drew Wiseman, and Professor Peter Collis. And please welcome our host, Professor Wang Huijun. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests. Welcome to join us at the Laureate Lecture of 2022 Tom Prize in Biopharmaceutical Science. I'm Angela Liu, your MC for today's event. To begin with, we would like to invite to the stage the host of this lecture, Professor Wang Huijun, Academician of Academia Seneca, to give us the introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Wang. Uh, good afternoon. I notice uh, this event is uh, executed in military precision. So, uh, so there was a countdown of 10, right? So uh, today I'm uh, allocated for 10 minutes. So I'll be sure I will finish uh, this uh, introduction in 10 minutes. Now today, uh, it gives me a great honor to uh, introduce uh, today's uh, uh, laureates of uh, 2022 uh, Tang Prize in Pharmaceutical Science. Now, uh, today, I think you all know that uh, we have three uh, laureates, uh, Dr. Uh, Kathleen Carrico and Dr. Drew Weissman and Dr. Pete, uh, Peter uh, Kulis. And <clears throat> all three of them are, of course, distinguished uh, scientists uh, globally, uh, and <clears throat> today uh, it's an event that was really remarkable in the sense that uh, uh, different kinds of uh, expertise have been joined together to develop this uh, remarkable uh, vaccines that uh, save millions, truly millions of lives. And uh, the, the start of uh, COVID-19 in the late uh, 2019 and, and early 2020, uh, sort of struck us uh, with great uh, uh, surprise as well as uh, shock. And uh, we all know that uh, to counter uh, this uh, infectious disease, a bit unknown, and uh, that requires all kinds of uh, tools uh, to, to uh, uh, counteract uh, this infectious disease uh, attack. And so uh, now, of course, drugs, antibodies, and so on are valuable tools. Uh, nonetheless, I think we all, for the global consideration, we all need uh, vaccines, as we all know. So early on, the vaccine development uh, was uh, kind of a bit slow uh, using a more traditional technology. However, uh, I think uh, in very short time, uh, some of the idea of this early uh, concepts of messenger RNAs might be used to, uh, to become a vaccine uh, has emerged. And fortunately, I think uh, based on the uh, remarkable contribution of those three scientists that we're going to hear their talk shortly, uh, they <clears throat> gave us an opportunity to uh, rapidly develop the, this vaccine. Of course, many governments uh, around the world have helped uh, in contributing these advances. Now, like in the United States, uh, I understand there was a project work uh, to pump in a huge amount of money uh, to facilitate the success of this. And so I think with this, uh, combining all the basic uh, science and translate it into the uh, truly useful technology and, and um, products to cure, or not cure, but uh, to pre prevent the infection of uh, this uh, uh, kind of obvious, uh, well, uh, a truly unknown uh, enemy uh, that give us uh, 
really a powerful tool. Now this uh, mRNA technology, as we will hear shortly uh, by the uh, three uh, uh, outstanding speakers, uh, gave us uh, this opportunity to develop uh, the, uh, the uh, vaccines, applicable vaccines in, sh in just one, within one year. And that is, a, <clears throat> that is a truly remarkable and uh, significant contribution to the world health. Now, uh, today, the three uh, laureates, I think you have been uh, hearing their <clears throat> introductions and so on, so I won't go too much into the details, but uh, suffice to say, I'd like to say that uh, they will give us three consecutive lectures, and uh, there will be no interruption between them. And so the sp first speaker, Dr. Carrico, will give us uh, a description on developing mRNA for therapy. The second talk will be given by uh, Dr. Drew Weisman, and uh, he will uh, discuss the nucleoside modified mRNA dash LMP therapeutics. Okay. Then finally, I think Dr. Peter Kulis will give us uh, <clears throat> some concepts uh, and, and the progress of the uh, development of uh, this LOMP uh, system. So his talk uh, will be on design of lipid nanoparticle systems that enable gene therapies. And so let's uh, welcome those three speakers and we look forward to their uh, wonderful talks. Thank you. Thank you very much to Professor Wang for the introduction. Please take your seat. And first of all, we would like to invite Professor Catalin Carrico to the stage to deliver her speech. Welcome. Thank you very much. It is wonderful to be here and accept the award together with my colleagues, Drew Weissman and Peter Kuris. Today I talk about how the mRNA was developed for therapy. I have to say that RNA was discovered in 1961 and it took uh, 60 years uh, when finally in a, mRNA became an FDA-approved product in the form of COVID-19 mRNA vaccine. And during the 60 years, a lot of things happened. So those who think that the uh, vaccine was developed overnight uh, is uh, mistaken because I would say uh, every 20 years, something happened. So the first 20 years was structural, functional characterization of the mRNA isolates. People couldn't make RNA as we could do today. In 1984, we could make mRNA, and it was another 20 years when scientists made different type of uh, mRNA coding different proteins, and then those uh, were tested out in uh, cell culture and in animals. And it's about like 2000 when the first RNA company was formed, and that was again in the 20 years when different human trials started. So this is what I'm talking about. So 1961, when mRNA was discovered, it didn't start with the clock. In 1961, when mRNA was discovered, and two papers published in Nature and uh, describing this unstable intermediate, this middleman, which carries the information from the DNA to the protein synthesis uh, place uh, with the uh, ribosome, and uh, the protein is made, and the protein can be an enzyme, produce lipids and other things, and that's what we are. So the mRNA was a very short-lived product. So at the beginning, the scientists couldn't synthesize the mRNA, they just could isolate. And then they looked at there. So scientists discovered that the RNA has a long poly tail, and then immediately invented purification. So 1972, uh, oligo-DT cellulose was introduced and RNA could be purified. So using this purification procedure, other scientists look at the fibram end, the cap part of the RNA, and 1975, 
many, many papers in Nature published about what is this structure all about. And uh, they already showed that if the cap is not present in the mRNA phi prime, and the uh, mRNA is not uh, translating. So a lot of discoveries was made in the 70s. Other scientists look at the uh, functional characterization of the mRNA. Even in the year when it was discovered, 1961, they already showed that they can uh, translate. But here, scientists uh, started to use reticulocytes, the precursor of red blood cells, and then, because those are enriched with uh, globin, pro, uh, glo globin mRNA, so they tested out in uh, rabbit reticulocyte lysate, they injected in frog oocyte, or they used liposome. And uh, they enrupt to the liposome, and then they fused to primary mammalian cells, and they demonstrated that the mRNA, when it was different delivery were used, they code that uh, critical uh, uh, protein. But it was all the time they just could use, you know, the beta globin coding uh, uh, protein. So, uh, what happened in this kind of time, I uh, was an undergraduate student and uh, I get the opportunity to work in the lipid laboratory and uh, we the supervisor, Erno and Eva, uh, tried to make a liposome because they were reading this paper, uh, which was Dimitriadis and Ostro published in Nature in 1978. And because I was in the lipid lab, I had them to isolate uh, phospholipids that um, uh, used for uh, liposome. And we, we did not deliver at that point RNA, we delivered plasmid DNA. And uh, we were very successful on that. And it is very important for all of the students to start something somewhere and then later, you know, think about a lot what was done. But that time I was undergraduate student. And uh, one day, uh, Janu Thomas walked in the lab. And, and that's how I went to the RNA lab, to, went from the lipid lab to the RNA lab. So I was not that smart to figure out that one day this RNA and the lipid belongs to it each other, so, but it by just happening by chance. So he actually synthesized some of those cap uh, structure for those scientists who discovered in the 1975. But here my respons respons responsibility was to synthesize this uh, short oligonucleotide, which had an antiviral effect. I worked together with Janusz Ludwig, uh, and even today, he's an organic chemist, even today, I ask his advice. So please, please be kind to your fellow uh, students because you don't know that how much you need their help one day. And this is also important, you know, that uh, uh, when we collaborated, I was, I was the biologist, set up the antiviral uh, lab because this uh, small molecule was responsible for antiviral activity. It was uh, naturally, this molecule is made by oligoadenylate synthase, and that, uh, when this molecule is made, activates RNAs L, which uh, then can, that was the idea, cut up selectively the viral RNA. As it turned out, you know, it's not that selective. Anyway, this was the first time, it was 1985, when I lost my job, and I have to say I wouldn't be here today if at least four times I would not lose my job. So things can be, uh, you know, it depends on, on your decision that uh, what do you do after your position is uh, terminated. So I went to the United States and Professor Suhadonik himself was also working on these two prime, five prime molecules. And actually he wrote the book on uh, basic, you know, nucleoside, uh, modified, modified nucleosides. So I worked in the lab and uh, so we did more of these 2,5A compounds, but uh, we could not formulate well that it would have good antiviral effect. So uh, what happened is in 1986, when uh, 
HIV was the major viral problem. Eventually, we couldn't use this antiviral compound, this short two prime, five prime, but uh, compound. But we used the double-stranded RNA, which was uh, mismatched, it was less toxic, and we treated the HIV patient with this double-stranded RNA. So as you can hear, I, wherever I was, I was working with RNA, different enzymes that uh, modify the RNA, and. Uh, uh, this uh, segment, now that uh, I was in 1985, is uh, when already scientists discovered how to make RNA uh, by design. And this happened in uh, uh, the Harvard laboratory. Uh, Tom Maniatis, Douglas Malton, Paul Creek, Michael Green, they discovered that if they use uh, phage RNA polymerase and from uh, plasmid DNA with the uh, promoter and adding all of the basic four nucleotides, capping enzyme, they can make an RNA which has all of the structural element and coding for beta interferon. When they injected this mRNA to the frog oocyte, what they found is that uh, the culture medium where these uh, injected eggs were incubated had the antiviral effect. So this was the first time that uh, scientists could show that uh, messenger RNA made in tube has a translating functional protein. So a lot of people get inspired by this uh, discovery, and you could see that in the 1990s, there are every year there was a paper out on mRNA. In these days, every hour, more, more than 10 papers is out. But uh, so it, uh, this time it was easy to follow the literature. I was mostly inspired this 1992 paper where it was shown that uh, mRNA coding for a therapeutic protein, vasopressin, and injected to the animal, which had uh, missed uh, and didn't have enough of that, they could treat the animal with that. So for that on, I set up that I will do uh, mRNA coding for therapeutic protein. But you can see that 93, 94 already, people started to use mRNA for vaccine. And the 95, 96 started to use for cancer vaccine. So infectious disease vaccine, 93, 94 for influenza, 95, 96 it was for cancer vaccine. So, but those scientists didn't follow up. And the reason was because the protein was made from these RNA was very small amount and was made in very short period of time. And uh, it degraded, and later we show also that it was immunogenic. So a lot of people, those even who I was inspired by, never published another paper on that field. So what you can see in the following years is that the mRNA was continuously was improved, and the formulation, the lipid formulation was improved. And many of these uh, steps were when the RNA was with the lipid formulation was uh, together uh, advanced and made the mRNA more translatable. And uh, eventually we come to the end when it was lipid nanoparticle was used to deliver mRNA. And uh, so this was needed, the delivery and the mRNA improvement, mRNA was purified and so on. So I started to work on uh, mRNA in 1989 when I joined the uh, uh, University of Pennsylvania, where here my colleague, Alice Kuo, she was um, uh, actually graduated from the high school I visited to, today, this morning, and uh, also the university, the uh, National uh, Taiwan University. And uh, two of us, or three of us, started to work and uh, uh, develop mRNA for therapy. Why I am showing this uh, urokinase receptor example here, because uh, this was uh, Elliot uh, Barnett, who is a cardiologist, was interested in this molecule to make sure that in the blood vessel, the blood will not clot. And this molecule was only, this protein only was um, uh, functional if all of this uh, post-translation modification, glycosylation, GPI, anchoring, other things were happened and it was modified. And, and uh, voila, we delivered the mRNA I made in vitro. And to, when we delivered to the cell, we could see that the uh, receptor was functional. So the cell knew what to do, how to uh, further process. So this uh, gave us uh, inspiration. 
But um, it happened again that, you know, I kind of lost the position. I was demoted and ended up in neurosurgery where I spent 17 years. Again, it, uh, David Langer helped me, who was in the prior lab, was an obnoxious uh, student, but, you know, I was kind enough to him that when he learned I lost the job, he helped me to get this one. So be nice to everybody there. And then here is this laboratory in the left corner. This is where I worked 17 years. And um, yes, so I did not have really lab coat and things like that, but you know, uh, for RNA, you have to be very careful. So what we did, we tried to develop uh, mRNA for therapy, mostly for stroke treatment. And uh, when we did all of these studies, like uh, we tried to deliver uh, nitric oxide synthase uh, enzyme uh, to dilate some blood vessels and others, when we injected to animals in the brain or others, we did not find that any problem would be with the RNA, whether it would be immunogenic, especially because the RNA coded for a protein which was already present in, in the body, in those animals, and I was not thinking that there is a problem. Up until that, met Drew Weissman. Really, we met at the Xerox machine as it was described, and uh, Drew was interested to make vaccine. I was interested to make therapeutic protein, and so, but, you know, we started to work together, made the GAG mRNA, and uh, he tested out on human dendritic cells, and uh, he concluded that it is a great vaccine because it codes for the protein, it also activates the cell, and uh, he measured the high level of uh, inflammatory molecules were secreted by these cells, which I was not very happy about because I want to develop for therapy. So we asked uh, the question, we drew that, uh, why, this, why this RNA is uh, immunogenic? Why it uh, increase uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha, for example? And if this RNA is the same, you know, which we have in all of our, our cells, but then the idea came that maybe the reason is because we are adding to these immune cells, these human dendritic cells, from outside, and maybe that's the reason. And maybe all of our RNA inside our body is immunogenic if it is coming from outside because the cell damaged or something. So we set it out that we will investigate why inflammatory and we isolated RNA from mammalian cells and different compartments, and what we tested out similar way. And what we found is that this RNA is, you know, the purple shows what I made in vitro in the tube, and those blue is uh, the different compartments where uh, E. coli RNA is shown in red. But what was interesting is that transfer RNA, when we delivered, were not immunogenic at all. And because the Transfer RNA has a lot of modification. Of course, many ways is different from the in vitro transcribe because it is shorter, it's different, five prime and three prime, end, but I'm just, for the shortness of the story, I'm saying that a lot of modification are there and 25% of the nucleosides are modified. So that the idea came that could it be that these modification, one of them, all of them, may be contributing that the tRNA is not immunogenic. So investigate that. I just showed this one to scare you a little bit, but how many modifications are there? And we were wondering that how we could test it out, because even the enzyme introducing these were not known. But uh, the only known was that how 2 prime methylation and pseudouridylation actually happening uh, in uh, the RNA, and actually discovered by a fellow uh, student from University, Pensi uh, from, uh, University of Seged. We lived in the same dormitory, and again, it is important not to know just only that Tomasz was a good uh, soccer player, but what he did after he finished, graduated. So he was working with RNA and discovering these things, and uh, so I asked his help, you know, to modify the RNA, but at that point in vitro, in, with this method, we couldn't do it. In, nat in nature, all of our RNA is made from the four basic nucleotides, and post-transcriptionally, modification are introduced by enzymes. So we couldn't follow on this one, decided that maybe we have to purchase 
well, how nature is not doing, but we have to purchase uh, nucleoside triphosphate, which already the nucleosides are modified. And uh, hoping that this uh, RNA polymerases will incorporate these to the RNA. So we were, in, were insisting that we are just using modifications that are uh, already present in, in the human body, so not uh, anything which is naturally not present. And uh, these uh, 10 uh, nucleoside triphosphate modified one was commercially available. And we purchased that and we tested out five of them could not incorporate, but five of them could. And so we generated this mRNA shown in this agarose gel. Then we tested out in the same way we did prior to these experiments when we isolated RNA use. And what we found is that in blue are uh, now showing that those which was uh, not containing any modified nucleoside. But then in the orange, you can see different modification still in use high level of TNF alpha. Those were still inflammatory, but more importantly, were some of them were not. So when we looked at closer, we found that all of them, which was not inflammatory, contains modified uridine. So this con we concluded that seems like nature selected uridine to be recognized as a extracellular RNA is coming towards an immune cell, and if we modify it, then we don't get activation. But of course, this was just one goal that not to activate. We also want to use it to code for some therapeutic protein or uh, antigen, so it was important to see that whether we can translate if the RNA, messenger RNA made with this modified one. Like uh, one of them, the two thiouridine were not translated at all, but most importantly, the pseudouridine containing RNA, which is in orange, is translated very well. So well, that 10 times better than the conventional uh, uridine containing RNA. So it seems like you know, a dream comes through because now we have an RNA, which uh, messenger RNA, which is not inflammatory, and 10 times more protein can be made from it. So. <clears throat> What happened here in the United States, usually that you file a patent, you publish, you establish, as we did with Drew, establish RNARX, uh, made a, a business plan, and uh, we submitted that we will use erythropoietin coding RNA, and we demonstrate that uh, it can increase the hematocrit and the reticulocyte level and the hematocrit in animals. And uh, so that's what we did in uh, 19... In 2012, we published that uh, when uh, transit uh, complex uh, pseudouridine containing RNA was injected to the animals in the mice uh, intravenously or, intra or intraperitoneal sometimes, here in um, uh, what we found is that uh, uh, when the erythropoietin encoding RNA was uh, containing pseudouridine, this is in red in the left panel. You can see that four days we could measure the protein circulated in the blood. And when we had the conventional unmodified RNA, and these are very small amount, 0.1 microgram. If you work with RNA, you would know that, or nucleic acid, how small amount. But when it was not modified, you can see in the blue that it disappeared quite quickly. The half-life is the erythropoietin is two hours. So it meant that when you had, when you injected a pseudouridine containing RNA, then it had to be continuously translated. So the mRNA was still there at uh, day four. And um, the right panel shows that the uh, produced uh, protein from this RNA was functional because the hematocrit increased, so the animal had higher uh, red blood cells. And when weekly injected, then uh, this, uh, we could maintain high hematocrit. And in the middle panel shows that so when we use pseudouridine containing RNA, there were no uh, interferon was in used in those animals. So with that, it seems everything is going well, but uh, that was uh, 10 years ago when last time I lost my job and, uh, and then I had to move on. So here I am talking about now the last 20 years for this uh, scheme because uh, CureVac was established in uh, 2000 and 2008 was uh, 
uh, BioNTech, and 2010, it was uh, Moderna. So the animal uh, studies finished, and or some is still follow up, and then clinical uh, started. So as I mentioned, 2013, when I lost my job last time, I went to Germany and joined BioNTech, with uh, established by Ugo Zain and Özlem Türeci, and. Uh, at that point, we were not in this fancy building shown in the right corner. We were on the campus and we were just a handful of people. But what happened there, we further optimized the RNA. We did a, a codon optimization, optimized the uh, uh, UTRs and the CAP. We introduced the CAP1. We did a purification and all of these modifications. Eventually, what it uh, resulted that now is not a short uh, period of time, very small protein was made. Was this was significant amount of protein was made quite long time. And so with this one, the optimized uh, mRNA was ready for uh, prime time. Why it is important to talk about that this mRNA is so important? I have to say because uh, the protein, therapeutic protein, which was FDA approved, it is the quick um, this is the largest segment of, uh, of the uh, approved product, and this is more uh, protein is are uh, approved, and they are uh, fastest growing uh, group of therapeutics. And um, there are many different kinds of uh, proteins. Actually, the first protein was insulin, which was introduced 100 years ago, 1920. It was purified from uh, animal uh, pancreas. And then it was 1982 when a recombinant protein, the first one introduced, actually, it was also insulin. And then those proteins, which is recombinant, is quite expensive because uh, it had to be purified and during purification sometimes changing the protein. So it is what it is is very expensive. And the idea is that if we deliver the mRNA, then the human body can uh, generate uh, the uh, protein, and so it would make it cheap and it would be more uh, reliable. So when I was at uh, BioNTech, so we started to use, because now that the uh, RNA translated very efficiently, so we generated bispecific antibodies. The bispecific antibodies is one arm is seeing the uh, uh, two more specific uh, protein on the surface of the tumor cells, and the other arm is seeing the uh, immune cells. And we generated uh, these kind of antibodies and uh, tested out in animals how we could eliminate, actually, uh, already established large tumor using this approach. In a uh, highlighted in yellow, you can see that these are already these uh, bispecific antibodies, mRNA, they already entered to the clinic. Actually, conventional RNA, uh, conventional uh, uh, antibody coding mRNA also entered. So this uh, uh, was followed up by uh, another studies where mRNA now is coding for uh, four different cytokines listed on the lower left corner. And these mRNAs, when we inject it to uh, animals that had like melanoma in this um, case of mice showing here. And uh, what happened is that uh, you could generate an obscopal effect. So the uh, injected tumor is, uh, um, which is at that point is called, but these cytokines will help the uh, different uh, immune cells to run to this tumor and figure out what, how to recognize tumor cells. And then when they circulate around the body, they can eliminate, as you can see on the right panel, that eliminate uh, uh, tumor from the lung. And uh, this, we started these uh, studies together with uh, Sanofi, and you can see here that also it's in clinical trial. So this, this idea is that there are cancer vaccines, but these are not vaccines because the mRNA is not coding for cancer antigen, rather it codes for cytokines. And, uh, and, and the case of antibodies, what I mentioned again, is not cancer vaccine, it is the mRNA codes for antibody recognizing uh, cancer-specific uh, proteins. So what happened now? We are in 2023, and now that uh, we uh, can see that more than 100 uh, 
150 uh, clinical trial is uh, ongoing. Uh, these are to prevent or treat different kinds of disease with mRNA. And uh, probably Drew Weissman colleague will talk about how many different uh, uh, vaccines uh, in, uh, during development for infectious diseases. Uh, for influenza, actually, BioNTech and Pfizer started uh, together working on 2018 to develop uh, mRNA-based influenza vaccine, which in 2020 put in the back burner because the COVID had to be developed. But this uh, both for Moderna and BioNTech has a phase three trial. ISV is also close to uh, proof by, uh, that uh, Moderna is developing. HIV, there are both Moderna and BioNTech has a, a program for that. Zika virus program also, so it is clinical trial. Herpes simplex, this was by uh, Penn and uh, together with BioNTech. EBV, CMV, NIPA, both. All of these were uh, by antiviral vaccine is developed. Then also bacterial uh, vaccines. So uh, for tuberculosis or Borrelia, which cause uh, uh, Lyme disease. And uh, this is a program uh, Borrelia for uh, developed by Moderna. And a malaria, which is a parasite, uh, that kind of uh, vaccine is also in development. The other thing is the cancer vaccine. Uh, all of these companies, Moderna, BioNTech, and CureVac, who were the first, one, first three ones there, they all established a cancer vaccine program. And that was the main goal, and uh, learned many, many things. And there are programs where the mRNA calls for shared tumor antigens. And uh, uh, these are from the patient sample, identify what kind of uh, tumor antigen present in, uh, uh, in the uh, patient samples. And those are uh, fixed vax uh, treatment. And there are uh, also, there are uh, vaccines where the patient uh, uh, tumor are removed. The sequence identifying neoactive and epitopes, those are which uh, resulted from mutation. And then messenger RNA is generated, which goes for uh, uh, these uh, new epitopes. And these individually for just uh, that patient is, can be used and they inject. And um, uh, at present, the success for cancer vaccine, you can say is uh, for Moderna is for the melanoma trial and for BioNTech is the pancreatic cancer. It is very critical that in both cases, the tumor was uh, not spread and the tumor was removed, dissected, sequenced, and then uh, the vaccine were generated. And the epitope in, uh, for uh, Moderna had 43 different new epitope they used. And then they used the patient and uh, they vaccinated uh, them. And um, what they could find is that the tumor uh, return is, was delayed very significantly. So this is how successful right now. But more uh, research is needed for that. Acute diseases, VEGFA, mRNA, relaxin mRNA for heart failure. Actually, VEGFA mRNA was uh, used uh, 2018 already with AstraZeneca and Moderna. So these were well before 2020 when the COVID happened. And uh, VEGFA mRNA is... Uh, this VGFA, which was coded by this mRNA, uh, generate new blood vessels. And these studies first started to uh, treat uh, uh, di diabetic patients' uh, necrotic wounds. And uh, they could see healing accelerated. And later, these uh, uh, mRNA were injected to patients who undergoing uh, bypass surgery. And, uh, and they injected naked RNA to the body of the heart. And they could see that heart to perform much better. There are uh, many genetic diseases which uh, is uh, started to uh, use mRNA for, for treatment. Uh, methylmalonic acidemia by uh, Moderna uh, reported success with the uh, uh, treatment. 
where the mRNA coded for this protein, which is uh, missing or very low level uh, present in the patient. And uh, more success uh, we could see when mRNA is coding for the Cas9 uh, uh, enzyme, which recognizing uh, with the guide RNA specific part of the human genome where problems uh, happen. And this was um, one of them is the uh, uh, amyloidosis and uh, other is uh, angiodema, and, uh, which um, maybe soon will be uh, FDA approved will be the sickle cell anemia when the, the mRNA uh, targeted by this uh, guide RNA to a specific part of the uh, chromosome where they interrupt. They are not in, in, uh, in, um, incorporating new genes or uh, it is just only interrupting a gene, which, uh, you know, whether it is making a faulty protein or whether uh, in the case of sickle cell anemia, the BCL11A, that if you interrupt, then you won't generate uh, uh, beta globin, but it will be gamma globin. So um, this is where it is. And then more uh, studies are coming for uh, treating allergies. These are peanut allergy, dust mite allergy, and it can in, induce tolerization. At BioNTech, we did studies where um, uh, we uh, also use for autoimmune disease uh, in the, inducing tolerization, and the, all of these studies need more uh, animal studies to uh, enter to human trial. And um, what I am doing now, I try to inspire the new generation. So I mentioned today I was in the high school. And um, uh, uh, here is with Drew and me doing some experiment how the, we are presenting ourselves to the children. And uh, I also wrote a book about my life experience. And with that, uh, I want to also thank to all of my colleagues who I work together, especially at, uh, at BioNTech. And uh, I am also happy to thank to my family, my daughter is who is a two times Olympic champion, and my husband who supported me always uh, in my studies. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much to Professor Perikol for your speech. Please take your seat. Thank you. And next, we would like to bring up to the stage Professor Wiseman to deliver his speech. Welcome, Professor Wiseman. Thank you very much. So what I wanted to do today is not spend a lot of time on heavy duty data, but talk to you about a few different aspects of RNA vaccines and therapeutics. First, I wanted to explain why RNA vaccines work so well. Hopefully everybody in this audience has had numerous RNA vaccines put in their arm I apologize for the pain and discomfort, but that just tells you it's working well. Uh, but what people don't understand is why the vaccine works so well. And then after that, I wanted to talk to you about the future of mRNA therapeutics. And I'll talk a few different aspects of specific delivery. So I'll quickly go through this. Katie mentioned it. RNA was first injected into an animal in 1990. And, and I, I bring this up because I, I speak with a lot of lay audiences. And what I try to explain to them is what the RNA vaccine is and why it works so well and why they need to take it. And I'm guaranteed to get one question from every audience, which is, well, I'm nervous because it was invented in 10 months. And I don't trust something that was invented so quickly. It wasn't invented in 10 months. RNA, mRNA was first found in 61. It's been in animals and people starting in 1990. But after that first injection, 
it was studied for vaccines. And that was for a number of reasons. Principally, there are 17 different innate immune sensors. So these are germline encoded proteins in all of our cells that produce a sensor that recognizes RNA and signals that it's foreign. And there's a number of different signals that are induced. It makes inflammatory cytokines. It makes type 1 interferons. It induces apoptosis and cell death. And it directly inhibits RNA translation. So Katie showed a version of this slide. When we were trying to figure out why was RNA immunogenic, we, we had the idea of, well, let's test a bunch of different kinds of RNA. Uh, because we, at the time, none of these toll receptors or other sensors had been identified other than PKR and OAS. Uh, and we wanted to understand, well, is it simply that RNA is inflammatory no matter how you give it to a cell? Or is there something special about the RNA? So we, we divided up cells, both uh, bacterial and mammalian, to different types of RNA. And we measured their inflammatory activity using dendritic cells. And we chose dendritic cells because they have most of those 17 innate immune sensors. And as Katie mentioned, what we found is that Does it work? The, the tRNAs had no inflammatory activity, while bacterial RNA was highly inflammatory. And that led to a hypothesis that maybe nucleoside modification and the level and the type that's in the RNA determines how activating it is to our cells. As Katie mentioned, there's over 100 different types of modified nucleosides. It includes things like isomerizations, methylations of both the base and the sugar. Recently, M6A was found to be reversible and involved in controlling translation. So we tested nucleoside-modified mRNAs, as Katie mentioned, and found that certain modifications got rid of most of the inflammatory activity. But that wasn't the striking part and, and the unexpected part. When we tested those modified RNAs to see were they still translated, and we had a bet at the time, uh, we of course lost that bet. Not only was the modified RNA translated, but it was translated much better than the unmodified RNA. Prior to this, every RNA delivered was either purified from cells or in vitro transcribed with polymerases. So the addition of nucleoside modified R, uh, modifications got rid of the inflammatory activity and greatly increased the amount of protein being produced. So th this is now early 2000s. And I was still going to HIV meetings, and I was seeing people like Tony Fauci, who I did my fellowship with, and Gary Nabel, who I knew from the NIH, and, and other luminaries in the science field. And, and they would ask me what I was up to and what I was doing, and I would sit down and explain what Katie and I were doing with mRNA. And they would smile, and they would nod, and then they would say, Drew, you know, why don't you give this up and do something useful with your career? You're wasting your time. RNA has failed clinical trials. It's never going to work. It will never make enough protein to be useful. You should just give it up and do something useful. And I would say, well, you know, let me try and explain why we're interested in this. Therapeutic proteins are one of the most advanced and advancing fields in pharmaceutical science. The problem is, is to make a therapeutic protein, you start with a 50,000 liter drum of CHO cells or other cells that make your protein. Then you have to figure out how to purify that protein away from cell culture contaminants. 
So what that results in is that the cost of a monoclonal antibody is typically fifty to $100,000 a year. That limits its usefulness. Katie and I would argue if you gave mRNA that encoded the protein, it was much more potent. It was easy to make. There were no Cho cells involved. There were no 50,000 liter drums. And it was probably safer because instead of relying on a tumor cell to fold and modify your protein, you're using host cells. We're the factory for protein production. They listened to that and smiled and walked away. So the, the first thing that we looked at, and this had been an interest of mine since leaving the NIH, was developing vaccines using mRNA. And we put together a vaccine, and this was early on, 2016 or so. Uh, and in this case, we used hemagglutin from influenza virus. And everybody here hopefully has had influenza virus, and you know that every year you have to get a new vaccine because the virus mutates. So the hope was, well, can you develop something that's broadly protective? And, and that's a goal of my lab and many other labs. But the first thing we did is we, we made a very simple vaccine. We put influenza HA in the mRNA, we encode, uh, encapsulated in LNPs that Peter will talk about, and we injected mice. And we did a comparison. So this is the mRNA. This is an activated virus, which is what us old folks get as a vaccine every year. This is live virus delivered to the nose, which is what we give our kids every year. And what was striking and what caught everybody's attention is that the RNA LNPs were 50 times better than an activated virus and five times better than live virus. Now, when you talk to a vaccine manufacturer and you show them a new vaccine that doubles your titer, they get excited. That's a significant increase. So when we showed Uger this and we showed him a 50-fold increase in titer, he got very excited and he funded our lab to develop vaccines for BioNTech. But as immunologists, we wanted to understand how this vaccine works. And this isn't described very much. You read in the New York Times and in our other famous publishing sites, the vaccines work well, but nobody really knows why. The way a vaccine works is that it does two things. It stimulates B cells to make antibodies, and it stimulates T cells to give help to make the antibody production better. There's a particular type of CD4 helper T cell that stimulates antibody production. It's known as a T follicular helper cell. And what this cell does is it forms germinal centers. In the germinal center, the TFH interacts with the B cells that are learning how to make antibodies. And they stimulate them to proliferate, to affinity mature, to produce long-lived memory and high levels of plasma cells that secrete antibodies. So what we wanted to know was this vaccine working through a specific induction of TFHs. To do that, we used the macaque model. So the, the specifics of the data aren't important, but the range of the numbers are. What we're doing here is we're using flow cytometry to measure antigen-specific TFH cell induction. So what we've done in these macaques is we've looked at them before they're immunized. We immunized them with an HIV envelope protein with a double-stranded RNA adjuvant. Double-stranded RNA is thought to be the most potent type of adjuvant for inducing TFH cells. And then we immunize with mRNA LNPs. And as you can see, the mRNA LNP vaccine gave enormous TFH responses compared to the best adjuvant out there. We've gone back and done calculations. 
So for your standard vaccine using alum or MFA or uh, uh, other uh, FDA-approved and unapproved adjuvants, typically 5% of the CD4 helper response is TFHs, and that's considered a good response. With mRNA LNPs, it's over 50% of the CD4 helpers are TFHs. And as I showed you before, TFHs drive antibody responses. This is the mechanism for why you see antibody responses that are five times better than infection in COVID-19 people. So let me now turn to the future of mRNA therapeutics. My lab and other labs, including Moderna and BioNTech and many others, continue to make a variety of different types of vaccines. Katie showed you some of them. We've got nine different vaccines in phase one clinical trials right now, including for th things like HIV, hepatitis C, C. difficile, norovirus, malaria, TB, and many other diseases. And this number is going to keep increasing. But what about what else can you do with RNA? Well, the, the original approach that Katie and I were thinking about was using RNA to deliver therapeutic proteins. And of course, the inflammation caused that to be derailed for a while. But since the inflammation was solved, we and many others are looking at delivering RNA to produce a therapeutic protein. Now, anybody who does nucleic acid therapeutics tells you the problem is delivery. How do you get the DNA or RNA or virus to the cells you want? Peter will tell you that LNPs go to the liver. They also go to dendritic cells, which is why you get a good antibody response. But my lab was interested in figuring out how can we target lipid nanoparticles to other cells, tissues, and organs. And we, we've started off concentrated on three main sites. One were endothelial cells, the vessels that line every organ in our body. The next were T cells, and the last were stem cells. But how do you target these LNPs? LNPs are made of four lipids. They have a small amount of PEG on their surface for about half an hour after injection. And then they're rapidly taken up by liver or dendritic cells. We, we asked a simple question. Could we add a targeting ligand to the surface of the lipid nanoparticle? and use a lipid that allowed it to stay with the lipid nanoparticle in vivo. And we used a variety of chemistries and a variety of antibodies or pieces of antibodies or ligands for receptors or other types of proteins. We're looking at mini proteins. We've looked at aptamers. So you can use any kind of targeting molecule and attach it to the surface of the LNP. When we did that, using electron microscopy, the morphology of the LNPs didn't change. They got a little bit bigger. That's about the thickness of an antibody coating. Most importantly, they retained function. They could still deliver the RNA. So these are PCAM cells, and P, uh, these are, uh, sorry, UVEX cells, and UVEX cells express PCAM. When we delivered LNPs that were not targeted, the UVEX cells didn't take them up and no RNA was translated. When we added an antibody against PCAM and added them to UVEX cells, nearly 100% of the cells now took up the LNPs and translated the RNA. So adding an antibody to the surface of an LNP targeted to a specific cell type and it retained activity. So we've studied a variety of different targeting systems with a, a bunch of different therapeutics in mind. 
one of the first things we were interested in were T cell targeting. And we did this because I come from Penn. And if you know Penn, Penn clinically developed CAR T cells. The first two CAR T cell drugs were developed and FDA approved by Penn. The problem with T cells and therapeutic nucleic acid delivery is that they have no endocytic activity. They cannot eat particles. Dendritic cells are great at it. Endothelial cells are good. Just about every cell in the body can eat particles except T cells. So our idea was if we were to target T cells in vivo, we would add an antibody that binds an antigen that endocytoses. And that way, we would bring the LNPs into the cells and get translation. And that's what we see here. So ibalizumab is an FDA-approved anti-human, uh, anti-CD4 antibody. And we added it to the surface of LNPs. For 293 T cells, it didn't matter. For HeLa uh, CD4 cells, there was a little bit of an increase. For purified human T cells in culture, without targeting, we got nothing. With targeting, we got very high levels of RNA delivery. So this told us that the targeting could target CD4 positive T cells, and it could result in RNA uptake and translation. We injected LNPs into mice. Here, they're targeted to mouse CD4. And we saw an increase in splenic delivery. Spleens have about 20% of their T cells are, are CD4 positives. But most interestingly, we re-imaged the animals after we removed all of those organs. So what we're doing here is we're delivering luciferase encoding mRNA. Luciferase is a protein that was originally derived from fireflies. And it's the protein that makes fireflies glow at night. So you can use this protein or RNA encoded protein to identify protein delivery. And we're doing the same thing here as, we're, as a firefly does. We add substrate ATP and we stick it under a microscope that measures light production. And what we found in these animals is that with CD4 targeting, and all of those organs removed, we still had activity in lymph nodes. These are paraortic and inguinal lymph nodes. So that means with a, an antibody-targeted LNP, we could deliver those LNPs intravenously. They would escape the bloodstream, go into the tissues, into the draining lymphatics, to the draining lymph nodes, there, they would target CD4-positive T cells, be taken up, and the RNA was expressed. So we switched to a, a, a model system. And this system uses an, a, an enzyme known as Cre recombinase. And Cre recombinase looks for specific sites known as LOXP sites. And what you do is you put LOXP sites around a stop codon. So if you deliver Cre recombinase, the stop codon is removed, and you turn on the gene. And usually you put it in front of a fluorescent protein. So any cells that take up the RNA uh, and the Cre recombinase is delivered turn green or red or whatever the fluorescent protein is. So we did this. We, at, we delivered targeted or untargeted LNPs with the Cre recombinase enzyme. And what we saw is when the cells were targeted, we got high levels of gene recombination, which equals green color, in the CD4 positive T cells in the spleen and in lymph nodes. Now, my lab started as an HIV lab and still does a lot of work in HIV. What we wanted to know, though, is what cells are we targeting? And what we've done is we've added an activation marker here. 
Th this is CD25. We've looked at other activation markers. And as you can see, the activity is equal in resting T cells as well as activated T cells. Why that's important for HIV is that the latent reservoirs, the latent virus that stays with infected people for a lifetime is in resting CD4 positive T cells. So the only way to get rid of it is you need a way to target it in vivo and we've been able to do this. And this is now moving into macaques to look at can we chop out the HIV provirus with Cre recombinase like enzymes as part of a cure strategy for HIV. We had very high levels of recombination, uh, both in spleen and in lymph nodes with a single treatment of a low dose of RNA-LNP. So it was also fairly efficient. So our, our conclusions from this were that we could add targeting ligands, antibodies, pieces of antibodies, receptor, ligand, proteins, uh, just about anything to the surface of an LNP and specifically target those cells to tissues, cells, and organs in vivo. We can deliver just about any protein that you can encode as an RNA. This in can include therapeutic proteins that are deficient or therapeutic proteins that have an activity. It can deliver gene editing, gene modifying uh, enzymes. The, your imaginations can go wild with everything that can be delivered. When I give this talk, I'm always asked, well, what about the brain? And there's probably a variety of reasons why I'm asked that, and I won't discuss them now, but we can talk about it later. But I always put this data in because we've been able to target the brain with LNPs. So I don't know if there are clinicians in this office that have done their residency, but my absolute nightmare from residency was getting it a patient admitted usually Friday evening, who just had a stroke. And they would come in with this CAT scan. And what the, this CAT scan shows is that there's a region of dead, dying brain here. This is a middle cerebral artery stroke. And the patient comes in, they have some hemiplegia, they're not feeling great, and our job was to take care of them. The problem is, is what happens to those patients over the subsequent days. And this is typically what happens. This small stroke has now spread. And what this is, is the dying and dead brain cells here release inflammatory mediators. And they induce swelling in the brain, which compresses more brain and kills a larger area of brain. This isn't compatible with a meaningful life, and most of these patients don't do well. The problem is, is that clinicians have tried every anti-inflammatory uh, and many different therapeutics with little success. So I, I work with some neuroscientists that have interesting models, and one model that they've got is that this is a mouse, and they can inject an inflammatory agent into one hemisphere of the brain. Uh, in this case, we're injecting TNF-alpha, which is a, a pro-inflammatory cytokine. And then we're delivering an anti-inflammatory mRNA. And what we wanted to know is could we alleviate that inflammatory activity with an LNP that was directed to the brain. Now, the way we directed it to the brain is we added a VCAM antibody. VCAM is an endothelial cell antigen that's upregulated in the brain in the setting of inflammation. So what we're looking at here is that in red, this is a sham-injected animal. They got the needle with no TNF. 
and you can see nothing happens. We're measuring vascular leakage in the brain. When we injected TNF, the inflammatory agent, and measured vascular leakage, it greatly increased on the side of injection, but not the opposite side. So we've got a built-in control. Here, in red, we've delivered an LNP that's targeted to the brain with VCAM and encodes thrombomodulin, which is an anti-clotty, anti-inflammatory molecule. And as you can see, we've returned vascular leakage back to normal. We've gotten rid of all of the vascular leakage by this highly inflammatory agent. This therapeutic is moving forward into clinical trials as a new way of treating acute strokes to reduce the spread of the stroke and the spread of the damage. So I, I mentioned CAR T cells before. I'll give you a quick review of why CAR T cells are special. So this is a cytotoxic T cell trying to kill a tumor cell. It has a T cell receptor that recognizes a tumor-associated or tumor-specific peptide, and it can kill that tumor cell. The problem is, is that everybody has different peptides that their tumors make and that can be recognized. So the idea originally developed by St. Jude's was make a, a variant of the T cell receptor that has an antibody or another binding entity on the surface attached to the T cell receptor signaling. In this case, and these are the first two FDA approved drugs, the antibody recognizes CD19. That's a marker on leukemia and lymphomas derived from B cells. Th this is FDA approved. It has efficacy rates in the 70% or so range, which for leukemias and lymphomas that, that were routinely deadly well, it is an incredible achievement. The problem is, is that to make a CAR T cell, you have to do this. You take a patient who's got extensive cancer, you leukopherese them. That, that's a machine that takes blood out, spins it in a centrifuge, withdraws the white blood cells, and gives the blood back. And it keeps doing that over and over for about two hours, and it takes out a couple billion white cells. You take those white cells, and you infect them with a lentivirus that encodes the CAR gene. You then expand that T cell prep for typically 10 days to make trillions of cells. And then you take those cells and you inject them back into the patient. It has 70% efficacy. It costs about a half a million dollars per treatment because this 10 days of fancy treatment is done in a GMP cell culture facility that's only present in limited numbers of sites, mostly in the USA and Europe. Our idea was if we could target lipid nanoparticles to T cells in vivo, and I showed you previously, we could get expression of the mRNA. But in this case, we would target the LNPs, and the RNA would encode a CAR molecule. In this case, we did a CAR molecule against a fibroblast-associated protein. And we used a model of cardiac fibrosis uh, to determine. So what we saw is that with this targeting, we could get protein expression in 80% of the CD4s and CD8s with a single dose, so very efficient delivery. These are echocardiogram measurements. And what they basically do is they measure heart motion. So in gray, these are normal mice. In yellow, these are fibrotic mice that their heart function isn't working well. Sorry. Uh, 
so what you can see is that when the mice are fibrotic, the, the volume, the size of the heart increases. And in the bottom, this is the ejection fraction. That's how much blood is pumped out with each beat. You reduce the amount of blood. The heart gets stiff, gets bigger, it can't beat well. In red, that's a single treatment of T-cell targeted LNPs expressing a car directed against fibroblasts. And as you can see, the heart returned to normal. It's functioning completely normal with a single treatment. We stained the tissue for fibrosis, which shows up in red. The saline is untreated mice. The uh, angiotensin phenylephrine are fibrotic mice. A single treatment with RNA LNPs just about return them to normal. We've also looked at targeting a variety of other cells and tissues. As an immunologist, I've always been interested in targeting bone marrow stem cells. There are thousands of genetic diseases in bone marrow stem cells. Nowadays, to treat them, the gene therapies do typically autologous bone marrow transplants, or they do gene therapy on their own stem cells. Both of those have fairly high levels of toxicity uh, and are incredibly expensive, two to four million dollars a treatment. We wanted to see, could we deliver lipid nanoparticles to stem cells in the bone marrow in vivo? with an IV injection. And as you can see here, with fairly low doses, we were targeting 90 plus percent of the bone marrow stem cells. Highly efficient. The way you test this is you treat the animal. In this case, it was a Crelox animal. So we gene edited the bone marrow stem cells, and we followed them over time. And we can see we're out to 16 weeks in this. And 100% of the blood cells, so these are red cells, white cells, and granulocytes, are green. So they were gene edited with a single treatment at very high levels, approaching 100%. Now, the ultimate test is you do a transplant. You take the bone marrow from these treated mice after about six months and you transplant them into uh, autologous mice that have been irradiated or given chemotherapy to deplete their bone marrows. So we're replacing their bone marrow with the transplanted bone marrow. And as you can see here, excuse the complicated slide, but red is all 100%, and red are the transplanted blood cells uh, myeloid, lymphoid, uh, a variety of different cell types, it doesn't matter. For all of them, 100% of the transplanted bone marrow cells were gene edited with a low dose of bone marrow targeted LNPs. Why is this important? We're developing therapies to treat sickle cell anemia with these LNPs. Now, sickle cell anemia is a fairly common genetic deficiency. The problem is, is it's started in sub-Saharan Africa. It, it's a way of the, that the body developed to defeat malaria. The problem is, is that it leads to a very painful disease and a much shortened lifespan. 300,000 people a year are born with sickle cell anemia mainly in sub-Saharan Africa, India, but across the world. You can't do ex vivo bone marrow gene therapy at $2 million a shot. That's unaffordable for the world. Our idea is that we've now got LNPs that will target bone marrow stem cells in vivo with 100% efficiency. Can we deliver gene editing machinery to fix that gene defect in sickle cell. So we've done this here. And this, this is uh, 
a mouse model of sickle cell anemia, and we've delivered an adenosine, adenosine base editor. So this is a Cas9 that's been turned into a base editor instead of a DNA cutter. And it, it changes a single nucleoside in the hemoglobin gene as directed by the guide RNA. It doesn't fix the hemoglobin, but it, it puts in what's known as a Macassar mutation that gets rid of the pathogenic activity of the sickle cell mutation. So you end up with a mutated hemoglobin, but it's a normal functioning hemoglobin where you don't get sickle cells. So you can see on the right, the arrows are pointing at sickle cells that are commonly seen in these animals. And on the left, after treatment, you no longer see any sickle cells. Here we're quantitating the gene editing ability of this enzymes delivered with lymph node tar uh, bone marrow stem cell targeted LNPs. We're approaching about 90% of the bone marrow stem cells have been gene edited and the sickle cell gene knocked out. So this has potential to be an inexpensive and easy way of treating sickle cell anemia in the field. You simply have to walk up to somebody with hemoglobin S, give them an IV injection of RNA LNPs, and potentially cure their sickle cell disease. And we're moving forward with help from the Gates Foundation to put this into clinical trials. So we can now perform in vivo gene therapy. And as I mentioned yesterday during my acceptance speech, a longtime passion of mine is equity of therapeutic developments and equity of drugs and vaccines. In vivo gene therapy will allow that equity. You don't need fancy hospitals and research centers to do gene therapy anymore. You can walk up to people, give them an IV injection, and cure their disease. This has applicability to thousands of other genetic disorders in bone marrow, in a variety of different cells that we can target. You can also use this to knock out stem cells as part of a, a, a bone marrow transplant for a variety of different cancers. The, the applications are just too numerous to mention. So I need to thank all of the people in my lab and all of the labs that I collaborate with to do these studies. Thank you. Thank you very much to Professor Wiseman. Thank you. Please take your seat. And finally, we would like to invite Professor Collis to the stage to deliver his speech. Welcome, Professor Collis. Okay, I think uh, by now you should be convinced that lipid nanoparticles are actually quite important. Um, so uh, I'm going to give you a bit of a background on how it is that uh, these lipid nanoparticles uh, were um, well, came to be. Um, so you've seen some of the, uh, the applications are becoming really quite stupendous uh, from what Katie and Drew have, uh, have uh, <coughs> described. So the... Uh, no, this thing doesn't work. Um, does anybody else have a laser? Because the allergy is too bright, so it's mm. No, I see. It's, it's not very bright. Yeah, I know, but I mean... It's very weak. Okay, the laser doesn't work. Um, the uh, <laughs> technology has its limits. <coughs> the... the um, Anyway, you, you may have heard that uh, this is uh, again a little bit uh, obscured here, but you may you may have heard that the vaccine revolution. This was uh, back in about 2021. Uh, <clears throat> some of the some of the titles said the vaccine revolution is coming in tiny bubbles of fat, 
Now, I have to say that I took this as a little bit of a uh, simplification. Uh, the, um, <clears throat> this is uh, both in the uh, popular literature on the left, uh, Bloomberg, and then on the right, uh, the, uh, even in the scientific literature, you are seeing these things referred to as tiny bubbles of fat. I wouldn't say I took this as a personal insult, but uh, you know, it's, uh, there's so much more than tiny bubbles of fat. Uh, it really took uh, 50 years uh, for lipid nanoparticles uh, to become an overnight success, as the term goes. Uh, so just going through my own history, you know, starting in about 1973, I uh, started some basic studies on membrane lipids, not thinking really of any sort of application from a, a therapeutic point of view. However, in 1985, uh, we uh, started to try to develop uh, lipid-based systems uh, to deliver cancer drugs, uh, <clears throat> to try and get them more accurately to where they're needed uh, in, uh, for, people, for individuals with cancer. And certainly is an ongoing problem <clears throat> that uh, we, we still need to solve. Although we did do some, some work there, some, some success there. But starting about 1995, and so again in this theme of, you know, these, these vaccines were not developed overnight. They were not developed in, uh, in 10 months. They were developed in, uh, in much longer periods of time. But starting in 1995, uh, the development of lipid-based systems to deliver nucleic acid-based drugs to target cells in, in vivo. Now, the, uh, the reason why some of these things, the format is wrong, is because uh, there's some translational difficulties. Uh, but anyway, the, um, the, in the beginning, I, I got my PhD in, uh, in physics uh, in, uh, in 1972, and I decided that I had to do something different. Uh, the uh, problem with physics is uh, that the basic theory is, for, for most phenomena, is pretty well understood. And so you could do an experiment. I was an experimentalist. Uh, you could do an experiment, but if you got an answer didn't agree with theory, uh, then your experiment was probably wrong, and I found that rather depressing. Uh, so uh, they, they seemed that there's so many problems that were more interesting outside the field of physics, and I would encourage the younger members of the audience uh, to, uh, you know, I, so I took a big transition here. I got interested in making these transitions is, I think, in the end, a good thing. I got interested, I knew a bit about nuclear magnetic resonance or MRI or what, <coughs> other, uh, other applications of that. Uh, and I, so I, I, I was awarded a fellowship to uh, go to the biochemistry department in Oxford and I knew nothing about biochemistry or lipids. It was rather, rather a, a disorienting experience to walk into a biochemistry lab, uh, particularly the animal room was right next to the entrance. I remember going in, I thought, wow, this is certainly different. Um, but the physics, my physics background turned out to be a good thing. This is me in 70s, 1975. You'll see some changes as the years have gone on. Um, and, but what do you learn as a physicist? And um, you learn a technique for sure. The other thing you learn is that uh, if, you, if you need an instrument that isn't available, then you build it. Uh, this is one of the precepts of uh, physics. So when I got there, I found well, while they'd been advertising that they had an NMR machine, Really, all they had was a magnet, and they didn't have the spectrometer to go to go with it. And so, uh, me and a graduate student uh, in in the lab, we we put it. We spent a year putting this uh, NMR machine together. Uh, so it's, uh, it was this was this was quite an effort. The uh, but we got it we got it going, um, and then we tuned the uh, the NMR machine to uh, to uh, phosphorus and and. Uh, so I'd look at the properties of lipids in biological membranes. Now, fossil lipids have a phosphorus atom in the head group, and so that's, that's the reason that we could detect lipids using uh, phosphorus NMR. Now, to orient you here, uh, the, a, a biological membrane uh, is shown on the left-hand side. It's a tremendously complicated uh, entity, uh, probably the most complicated entity uh, in, uh, in nature, <clears throat> in, in biological systems anyway. And it consists of, uh, a, a basic element of this is what's termed lipid bilayer, which is what you see in the middle. And the lip, so this, this, this is lipid bilayer uh, separates the inside of a cell from the outside. And so without this, of course, a cell couldn't, uh, couldn't form, couldn't function. And so the, uh, the, the, uh, the lipid bilayer consists of lipids, as you see on the right-hand side, 
with a head group that contains the phosphorus, and then these acyl chains, these, uh, the chains that they repel water, so they're hydrophobic. And so these are the, there's about 100 or more different species of lipids in a given biological membrane. And uh, <coughs> so the, but they have, all, they have really different properties. If you, if you, if you take, if you extract the lipids from, from, from these biological membranes, uh, <coughs> you're probably wondering why this has anything to do with uh, vaccines or anything else. I can tell you it was absolutely vital that we, we, we did these very basic studies. It's a great example of how basic science uh, can inform, uh, can inform, you know, give you, give, give you uh, techniques and uh, approaches that, uh, uh, that really enable uh, some advances. So some of these lipids, uh, <clears throat> how do I go back here? Yeah, there we go. Uh, will adopt, if you put them in water, when you extract them from a membrane, put them in water, they will adopt these non bilayer structures. So what are, what, are, what are they doing there? That was the question we were asking then. And then also, uh, <clears throat> the lipid composition on one side of a biological, so on the right-hand side here, on one side of a biological membrane uh, are, is different from the other side. And so we said, okay, well, what consequences does that have? And can we drive lipid asymmetry? And what is, uh, what, what, <clears throat> what's, uh, what is the result of that? And so the, what we discovered was this phosphorus NMR using our NMR machine that we'd managed to put together. Uh, we could detect uh, which structures these lipids were in uh, by the type of NMR signal that we saw. So we take the phospholipid that we extracted, we'd add water, they spontaneously adopt uh, the, uh, <coughs> the structures. You can see there the bilayer structure. And we see this characteristic shape uh, with a low field shoulder, high field peak uh, <coughs> the phos by phosphorus NMR. Whereas for the hexagonal phase, we'd see a peak with reverse asymmetry and that was about a factor of two narrower. And these corresponded to bilayer and hexagonal phases. And we just interpreted this in terms of what you see in the right-hand side, uh, which was uh, the shape of the molecule. The lipids that were in the uh, bilayer phase, for example, the area subtended in the, in the head group region was the same as the area subtended by the acyl chains. <clears throat> Whereas in the case of the hexagonal phase, uh, the uh, the area in the head group was somewhat less. So so this this was this was a uh, a use of you know from the point of lipid polymorphism. This was very we published many papers in this area, uh, <clears throat> but I'm not going to talk about those although I could for about an hour or so, but probably not too conducive to uh, uh, passing on good information about vaccines. Anyway the. We also used a different, a different form of, uh, of model membrane, as we term it, uh, <clears throat> to, uh, to look at the consequences of lipid asymmetry. And so we could, we could make these, lip, these uh, liposomes or unilamellar uh, vesicles. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, so in order to look at lipid asymmetry, we, we could add a little bit of what we termed an ionizable cationic lipid uh, to that. Now, this ionizable cationic lipid turned out to be very useful. Uh, as, we'll, as we'll find out. Uh, but this was just originally, originally we developed this lipid because at low pH, th this is at, uh, on the left-hand side, at low pH, um, now the, <coughs> the, the pH 4, for example, uh, the, the, this, this, this lipid became protonated. And uh, so this is not very acid. pH 4 is about the acidity of a lemon. And then so it became protonated and positively charged. Whereas at neutral pH, it's, it's, it's net neutral. And so if we had a, a little vesicle here with a pH 4 on the inside and pH 7 on the outside, pH 7 being physiological pH, uh, <clears throat> these, uh, the neutral form could go across the membrane very easily, but it would get to the inside, become protonated, and it would stay there. And so we could generate lipid asymmetry. And so that was the, and we could do the, all kinds of things, you know, make, make, make different shapes. If you have different Lipid, uh, <clears throat> lipid distributions, you can make all kinds of different shapes and uh, all kinds of interesting consequences. But this is where we got a bit distracted. Uh, the, um, we, got, we got distracted by the drug delivery potential because what we found was that we could, uh, we, could take, we, we could accumulate drugs into these lipid nanoparticles. And I should say, these are pretty small. They're, one, one, they're about 100 nanometers or less in diameter, one one hundredth the diameter of a cell. So, so they're, really, they're really quite tiny. 
Uh, but we could pack, we could, we, we found we could accumulate uh, a lot of drugs into these, uh, into these vesicles, uh, and they would go across in their neutral form, become protonated, and then positively charged or charged molecules don't permeate through lipid bilayers very well, so they'd be trapped on the inside. And if you do the maths here, the, uh, an equilibrium uh, be a thousand, say for a three, three uh, unit pH gradient, we'd have a thousand times higher concentration of the drug on the inside versus the outside. So this, this is just, just doing this in, uh, you know, for, just to give you an illustration, this is a cryo-TEM, and just showing that for these uh, vesicles, you can see the track around the outside of these vesicles on the right-hand side, that's the lipid bilayer. And then the crystal in the middle is uh, doxorubicin, which is a common anti-cancer drug, uh, which we could trap, say, 100,000 molecules of, uh, of this cancer drug inside. So they made really ideal delivery systems to deliver these, these molecules uh, more specifically to where we might need them. Uh, so we founded a company, again, another picture of me and four postdocs in my lab. This goes back to about 1992. Uh, uh, we said, okay, well, this is really interesting. Uh, maybe we can form a company to deliver cancer drugs more specifically to where they're needed. But actually, uh, within a short time, within about three years, uh, mainly because we had to raise money to keep this company going, and it was easier to raise money doing gene therapies than putting older, older cancer drugs in liposomes. So we started to work on, on, on uh, <coughs> delivering nucleic acid-based drugs. And so here we had to package them not in, in a lipid nanoparticle, but the problem was much bigger. Uh, for, for cancer drugs, all you had to do, even though this is very difficult to do, but is to get the drug to the site, to a cancer site, and then the drug will get into cells of its own accord. In the case of nucleic acid-based drugs, it not only has to get there, but you have to deliver it inside the cell, uh, <clears throat> into the cytoplasm in order for uh, the, uh, the molecule to be able to do any work whatsoever. So we had, a, we had a problem right off the bat. Uh, the um, the uh, nucleic acids are, as, you, as you're aware, uh, negatively charged, uh, very negatively charged. And so the, um, in order to encapsulate uh, these, uh, these nucleic acids in a lipid nanoparticle, we had to use positively charged lipids, which were termed cationic lipids. Now, the, there's, no, there's no positively charged lipids in nature. Uh, they're really highly toxic. There's only net neutral lipids or negatively charged lipids. And so this was a, uh, <coughs> this, 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 so, so in order to get past this problem, uh, we, we, we went back to, what, to these uh, ionizable lipids that we developed for our lipid asymmetry work. And we said, okay, well maybe if we go down in pH to pH four, uh, we can encapsulate uh, nucleic, these nucleic acid-based drugs this was antisense, antisense molecules at the time. Uh, maybe when we come back up to neutral pH, we can maintain uh, these molecules within the lipid nanoparticle. And that's turned out to be the case. And so uh, we tried uh, DODAP, which is our, the, 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 the lipid that I indicated uh, that for which we were generating lipid asymmetry. Picture of Sean Semple on the left-hand side who actually did the first, some of these first experiments. And it, this actually worked pretty well. What we found was we could dissolve these lipids in, uh, in ethanol, in organic solvent, um, <clears throat> together with what we might term helper lipids, uh, <coughs> you know, phosphatidylcholine and cholesterol, and then mix that rapidly uh, with a solution, uh, aqueous solution at pH 4, uh, containing the nucleic acid uh, that we wanted to, to encapsulate. So conceptually, you can think about this. Here we have, we're mixing these, the, these, two, these two streams very rapidly. The first thing to fall out of solution is going to be uh, the, the negatively charged nucleic acid surrounded by the positively charged lipid. Now, if you do this fast enough, uh, the, <clears throat> these other lipids, the, uh, the polyethylene glycol lipid, which is the one with the squiggly line here, uh, will fall out of solution and encapsulate that and really trap it in a limit, what we term a limit size vesicle. So these, these, these are the smallest vesicles or the smallest uh, particles uh, that are compatible with the molecular makeup of the, uh, <coughs> of the entity. And so this, 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 was, a, uh, this was actually a bit, of an, a, a bit of an advance because these systems turned out to be relatively non-toxic because they weren't charged. 
or a relatively, poor, relatively low charge at, P, at a neutral pH. Uh, they have a, what we term a hydrophobic core uh, as opposed to an aqueous core, and they're really ideally suited to encapsul encapsulation of negatively charged macromolecules uh, such as uh, sRNA and mRNA. So we got uh, excellent encapsulation efficiency. We could dial the size by changing the ratio of surface lipid to core lipid as a scalable and re reproducible process. So I was at a conference in London in uh, 2004, and uh, the, um, I, I was uh, accosted by uh, a guy named Victor Kataliansky, who was the vice president of research uh, for a company in Boston called Alnylam. So Alnylam had been founded in 2002 to deliver something called small interfering RNA uh, to silence a particular gene or si silence genes in, uh, in target cells. And they wanted to silence the gene in the liver. He said, we have a delivery problem. How, how can we how can we get our uh, small interfering RNA uh, into, uh, into the liver, into hepatocytes uh, in vivo? And this, this was, um, uh, I should say I was pursued by Victor. The, the, we, 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 went, we, we were, he led me through half of Soho before we managed to find a place to, uh, <clears throat> to discuss this. But it was really a very, very productive interaction uh, with a seven year collaboration uh, that we uh, went through with with acute with with the alnylam uh, to develop genes develop uh, these lipid nanoparticles containing small interfering RNA to silence the gene in the liver. We had teams in Vancouver and teams in as you can see here teams also in Boston. And the, we started with this question. We had this very simple system that you'll see as as I've indicated came out of some pretty basic research. The simple system that could contain uh, small interfering RNA uh, together with these ionizable lipids, uh, this uh, DODAP, uh, surrounded by these PEG lipids in this kind of structure. And so could that do anything uh, when, we, uh, <clears throat> when we administered this to, uh, when we were trying to, trying to, trying to deliver uh, sRNA to the liver? So these, these particles get into cells by a process known as endocytosis. And so what, th this has entailed a rather interesting design problem because the, uh, we wanted them to get to taken up by endocytosis, but then to get out of the endosome and in a sense to destabilize the endosome. And, uh, and so this, this really meant we had to design them so they fused with the, um, with the membrane surrounding the endosome at some vulnerable points in the endocytotic process. Uh, so they deliver the nucleic acid, the sRNA, into the cytoplasm. And so how, can, how, how could that happen? How, how could we destabilize uh, the membrane, the lysosomal membrane? Well, this, was, this got us back to lipid polymorphism, our very basic studies on, uh, on, on the structural properties of lipids. Because it turned out that if you add a, uh, to a, an anionic lipid is a negatively charged lipid, such as the lipids you find in nature, if you add a positively charged lipid, you flip them over from a bilayer structure to these non-bilayer structures. And so as you can see on the right-hand side here. And so this, uh, this gave us a, what we term a rational design process uh, so that we could start to say, okay, how can we design these ionizable lipids uh, so that it'll give us maximum uh, disruption of the of the endosome and th therefore maximum delivery at, into the into the cytoplasm, and so this is the kind of process that uh, we envisage happening. On the left hand side we have our lipid nanoparticle containing our <coughs> our oligonucleotide or nucleic acid based drug. The the green is the uh, ionizable lipid, and the low pH of the uh, of the uh, endosome the endosome. Uh, there is, the pH of the endosome is reduced as it matures, then these are converted to a positively charged form indicated in red here, which induces fusion with the negatively charged lipids on the, plas on the, en the lysosomal, on the, <coughs> on the endosome, uh, there, <coughs> which in the end results in delivery of the, uh, of the uh, nucleic acid to the interior of the cell. Now, we, we don't have any definite proof that this is what's happening, <clears throat> what's happening, but it certainly co correlates extremely well 
uh, with the uh, with the, the results. Now we get into more of the animal side of this. So we assess the potency of these systems using what we was termed a factor seven model. And so factor seven is a clotting protein that's made in the liver, uh, and it's also and then it circulates in the in the circulation. And so it provided a quite a convenient assay. We had factor seven that would uh, silence, well, we had sRNA that would silence factor seven. If we injected that intravenously into a mouse, uh, then we could assay for factor seven in the circulation uh, some 24 hours later. And so obviously if the, if the sRNA that silences factor seven was getting into hepatocytes, uh, then we'd see lower levels of the uh, of factor seven in the circulation uh, at, the, uh, at the time of the assay. And so what we found was that uh, not only was the ionizable lipid useful uh, in terms of encapsulation and getting a low toxicity system, uh, but the structure of the, uh, of the, uh, of the ionizable lipid uh, could markedly, uh, markedly affect uh, the uh, activity. And so this goes, all these, all these ionizable lipids on the right-hand side here must look uh, very similar, and they are. They've all got a tertiary amine and uh, dilinoyl acyl chains, uh, but they, they, they differ in one particular way, and that is the, the pH at which they become protonated, so-called pKa. Marcus Cifellini is a chemist I've been working with for the last 17 years now, uh, is really quite a genius when it comes to making these systems. And so what we found was that, that uh, there was a, 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 this is a, a plot of the potency, uh, it's one over the effective dose to get 50% gene silencing in the liver against the pKa of these lipids. And we found that a pKa of 6.4, you know, if you're a 0.5 of a pH unit away from that, in terms of the pKa, then the activity go, would go down uh, by a factor of 100 or so. And so, this is, this is a, <clears throat> over the course of the collaboration with Alnylam, uh, we went from a dose of about 10 milligrams or more of sRNA in order to get 50% silencing of the factor, of factor, of the factor seven, uh, down to five micrograms of sRNA. So really quite a dramatic change in, uh, in, <clears throat> in potency. And this was without increasing toxicity at all. And so, the, uh, if, so we had a, a ther what's termed a therapeutic index of over 1,000. In other words, we could give a 1,000 times higher dose uh, before we'd see any toxic effects. And so this is ready to go into the clinic at this point. So the results of this, of this approach <clears throat> in, 20, in 2012 was that we could silence uh, at factor seven in the liver. Now these gene therapy approaches are remarkable in the sense that once we knew that we could silence factor seven, we knew we could silence any gene we wanted. All we had to do was change the sequence on the sRNA, and we would be able to, able to do that. And so the clinicians at Old Island said, okay, well, we're, what we should do is develop a lipid nanoparticle uh, <coughs> containing sRNA to silence a gene called uh, transthyresin. And the uh, reason for this is that there's a disorder uh, known as transthyretin-induced amyloidosis that affects about 50,000 people worldwide, a very nasty disease, actually. Uh, and uh, so the, uh, this was a, a natural um, hereditary target uh, to, uh, to, uh, to test this uh, approach on. So uh, this, is, this is HATTR. So uh, tra transthyretin is made in the liver. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's then secreted into the circulation it usually forms uh, this uh, tetramer, but if there's a mutation, there can be many mutations, then it will form fibrils that presumably will uh, distribute all through your body. Uh, and has really, the, the, these fibrils deposit particularly in nervous tissue and in cardiac tissue and, for, and have very nasty, very nasty effects. There's really no effective therapy. It's usually fatal uh, within uh, five years of diagnosis. And so the, uh, this is what you can see in terms of the, the, the uh, prognosis, a pretty nasty disorder when you think of an individual who starts to have trouble walking when they're in their 30s, and they'll know what they're in for uh, because they'll have seen a relative uh, go, through this go through this condition. So a, a really nasty disease, but as I say, with the gene therapy approaches, 
uh, it's a very straightforward to develop a really targeted therapy. This has shut down the production of transthyretin. We should reduce these levels of fibrils in the circulation. And uh, perhaps if we're really lucky, uh, we should get some stabilization as the plaques, already established plaques, are, are, uh, are cleared. So uh, really a, a potentially simple solution to what's obviously a nasty disease. Uh, so the, uh, the, this was moved into clinical trials in, 20, in 2013. And so this is the results of a phase one study in healthy volunteers. Uh, and just pointing out that at about a dose of 0.15 milligrams per kilogram in these healthy vol volunteers, then the levels of transthyretin in the uh, blood were knocked down by about 80 to 90 percent, and that which lasted for about two or three weeks. And so, on the basis of this, clinicians chose a dose of, um, of 0.3 mg of sRNA per kilogram body weight, uh, given every three weeks intravenously uh, for subsequent trials. So this is the results of a phase three study uh, <coughs> that uh, was done uh, that ended in 2017. So on 225 patients, 148 of them getting uh, the drug, the, the lipid nanoparticle containing uh, the small interfering RNA that uh, <coughs> to uh, silence transthyretin, uh, and then 77 getting sterile saline as the, uh, as the control. And then the primary endpoint was a change in what's called the neural impairment score. In other words, the me a measure of the, um, the measure of the neuropathy that was induced by the uh, transthyretin. And there's also secondary endpoints, qual self-reported quality of life, weakness, ability to walk, body mass, as you saw, it's a wasting disorder, et cetera. Now this is where it gets quite spectacular because this is looking at the results over the 18 months of this, uh, of this trial. And as you can see, the neural impairment score got steadily worse uh, for those patients uh, that, um, <clears throat> that, did, that were getting the sterile saline, where if, whereas, if anything, the individuals uh, that were uh, receiving lipid nanoparticle containing transthyretin uh, were getting better. So we're reversing the effects of a hereditary disorder. And so this, this, this was, uh, this result, this is the, the uh, <clears throat> the um, overall results for this clinical trial, an absolutely spectacular um, <clears throat> set of results, uh, p-values that uh, left absolutely no doubt uh, that uh, the, uh, the drug was working, and 10 to the minus 24, this one over Avogadro's number. So, you know, this, this, this drug really works. Uh, the, um, <clears throat> and similarly, for other, for other secondary endpoints, quality of life, again, p-values that were uh, completely convincing. So it's a stabilizing and really quite a curative disorder, uh, a curative therapy for what was uh, previously a, a, a fatal disease. So I thought this is about as good as it gets for my career, uh, the uh, being part of, of something where we, we have a, you know, such, such a we've, I've been part of a group that's had such, a, such an effect. But that was, uh, that was uh, not, the, there were bigger things that followed so this, the, this is the first FDA approval of a RNA, RNAi-based based drug. It was a clinical validation of the lipid nanoparticle approach and um, really dramatically demonstrates uh, the uh, power of these gene therapy approaches. But when, the, when uh, on Patro, as the drug is termed, uh, went into, into, into the clinic in 2012-2013, uh, a company that I'd co-founded uh, called Acuitas, we said, okay, well, gee, we can't work on the drug, this drug anymore because uh, it's in, in the clinic. You can't change things after it goes into the clinic. And so maybe we should see whether or not we could deliver uh, messenger RNA, which is much larger than the small interfering RNA. And so uh, <clears throat> we decided to see whether this approach that we developed uh, to uh, package the small interfering RNA using this mixing technique, I mean, <coughs> dissolving the lipids in ethanol and mixing with the, uh, with the, in this case, the messenger RNA in a low pH, a pH 4 uh, <coughs> buffer. And uh, we got very similar structures coming out the other end. Uh, that, uh, so this was, in other words, the encapsulation procedure really worked quite well. And we found that if we injected this into, into animals, into, uh, into mice in this case, that, that 
we could then see, and this is using the cipherase that, uh, that Drew was referring to earlier as a marker enzyme, uh, the, uh, at three hours and at six hours, we could see that we were actually transfecting the liver uh, using, using this approach. In other words, proteins were being made in the liver uh, using these very similar, we did change some of the lipid compositions in order to get these results, but using very similar sy systems to what we developed for small interfering RNA. And so we've gone through a process here of <clears throat> developing more and more um, potent systems, part of that being uh, improving the acyl, improving the ionizable lipids uh, <clears throat> to uh, get to further and further improvements. Now, your liver makes, I don't know, 70% or so of the proteins in your body. And it doesn't seem to mind making a few more. And so the, uh, <clears throat> the, the <clears throat> if you inject, in this case, pigs, this is uh, work uh, done uh, <clears throat> in, um, I guess, 2015, 2016, something in the, like, like that. But the, uh, the, if, if you inject mRNA coding, in this case, for erythropoietin, uh, the, um, the liver will then, uh, <clears throat> will then make erythropoietin. This is in superphysiological levels. Now, this is a pretty useful process. When you think about it, child is born lacking a certain enzyme, we can get the liver to make whatever. And so this is the direction we were going in. Uh, and this is work done with Drew, uh, the uh, injecting mRNA coding for uh, a monoclonal antibody against HIV. And what was shown here was that uh, these, these systems were very effective. They produced the, uh, I don't have that uh, slide in here, but uh, they produced the, um, the uh, monoclonal antibody against HIV and give protection to the animals against a subsequent infection. So you can actually get, you know, these monoclonal antibodies being expressed in the circulation and it has potential therapeutic benefit. But as I say, this is where we got quite lucky because uh, we were approached by, by, by Drew in, 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 and to some extent Katie in, uh, in 2012, in 2014, uh, and uh, you know, they had a problem that you've heard about, which was to, uh, okay, how do we get our messenger RNA coding for viral proteins uh, into muscle and immune cells uh, in, um, in vivo? And so the, 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 obviously seeing the results that we'd been getting, uh, getting proteins expressed in the liver following an IV injection, and so the, the objective here, of course, was to take a viral protein, have messenger RNA coding for that viral protein, and then inject that intramuscularly uh, to see whether, uh, if, the proteins were ex if the proteins were expressed in immune cells, it would see a reasonable immune response. And you've already heard uh, that that was actually uh, pretty, uh, <clears throat> you know, the results were fairly compelling. So this is uh, just indicating we wanted to simulate a vigorous MHC1, MHC2 uh, an immune response. And uh, as Drew has indicated, uh, <clears throat> that was certainly observed. So the first, the first example of this, and again, this is work done, was done with uh, uh, Drew and his, his lab, the University of Pennsylvania, was to try and develop a Zika virus vaccine. And so, the, uh, again, so here, the, uh, the, the messenger RNA in the lipid nanoparticle was coding for uh, what's termed the Zika virus premembrane and envelope glycoprotein. So one of the proteins on the uh, virus you can see in the top right-hand side here. And uh, this, uh, this afforded uh, total protection against the Zika virus. And so this is a test in, in an animal system uh, indicate where we injected or uh, party at all injected lipid nanoparticles containing uh, messenger RNA coding for this premembrane protein and uh, <clears throat> injected that subcutaneously or intradermally and then challenged it two weeks or 20 weeks with, um, with uh, <clears throat> 200 PFUs of, uh, of the Zika virus itself and seeing total protection uh, in, these, uh, in these systems as you can see here. Uh, the, um, the, the, the animals, uh, the immunized animals uh, were, uh, gave no evidence of, um, of, of infection whatsoever. So this really, uh, this really triggered a number of events. One of them was that we, we being acutists, 
started to work with, um, with BioNTech uh, in, uh, in Germany uh, to uh, develop a flu vaccine. This was about 2017 or 2018, 2019. And um, <coughs> BioNTech in turn, in turn had been working or was working with Pfizer uh, to develop a, um, a flu vaccine. And of course, uh, the, um, <coughs> when the pandemic hit, uh, the, uh, all, at all, attention pay all attention was uh, then diverted to making a vaccine uh, for for flu for uh, for COVID-19, and so in this case, the messenger RNA that was packaged into the into the lipid nanoparticle, of course, uh, was mRNA coding for the SARS-CoV-2 spike uh, glycoprotein, and so the, this this uh, the, the results of this trial. I mean, I'm sure everybody's aware uh, is now history. Uh, the results were uh, were um, <clears throat> announced in uh, 2020, in November of 2020, 95% uh, effective, and I think we were all kind of stunned by that result. Uh, and that was uh, consistent across gender, age, uh, ethnicity, et cetera, and their vaccine was pretty well tolerated. The bottom here, you can see it was anticipated they'd manufacture 1.3 billion doses uh, by the end of 2021. I think they were closer to 3 billion by the end of 2021 and another 3 billion in 2022. It's been a, <clears throat> it's been a, um, uh, you know, a really, a really quite an amazing process here to see this approved by in various jurisdictions and certainly played a major role uh, in ending the COVID-19 pandemic. So, I just want, wanted to say, say that you know this has been 27 years of uh, to develop lipid nanoparticles beginning, but really this is beginning with very very basic science, uh, trying to understand the roles of lipids and membranes, and that's really what's what led to these lipid nanoparticles that have had you know a pretty fundamental a pretty fundamental effect in terms of new therapeutics. So the uh, as, as uh, Drew was emphasizing, though, the journey here is just beginning. Uh, the, uh, these lipid nanoparticle systems are really, uh, I, I, I term them the third generation of pharmaceuticals, the first generation being small molecule drugs, aspirin or cancer drugs, whatever, second generation biologics, such as monoclonal antibodies. But the third generation is going to be these lipid, nano, the lipid nanoparticle messenger RNA uh, gene therapies for protein replacement, uh, vaccines, and gene editing um, <coughs> therapeutics. So uh, I looked up the number of clinical trials. I think that um, Katie had 150, I had 450, but uh, there's a lot of clinical trials going on in this in, 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 that are really pushing uh, these, these approaches. Uh, using mRNA and uh, and, MR and different nanoparticle delivery systems, we are going to see certain things coming along again, as uh, was in, it was indicated by by Drew. Uh, <clears throat> one of them being a universal flu vaccine. Uh, this is just indicating the uh, <clears throat> if we take uh, about four proteins associated with influenza, uh, that, that and then have mRNA that's coding for all all of them. In a lipid nanoparticle that uh, that that already affords protection against different strains, going right back to 1934. Uh, and so these are the hopefully in in the near future we won't have to have a new flu vaccine every year. Uh, the um, this is a uh, for for atherosclerosis. It's got a little bit obliterated the title here, but prevention of atherosclerosis. This is just gene editing uh, on a protein in the liver. Uh, that regulates the amount of low-density lipoprotein, or so-called bad, bad cholesterol, uh, in the blood. And you see you're getting a 60 to 70 percent reduction uh, using, using this, uh, the, uh, this uh, approach to gene editing, to knock out that particular gene uh, in the liver. So we can see like it's an immunization against what kills about 50 percent of us, which is atherosclerosis. So quite kind of monumental. Th this is a slide that's already has already been shown uh, by Drew, but it began pointing out that, was this Drew or Katie? I'm not quite sure which one, I'm getting a bit mixed up here. But anyway, uh, again, pointing out treatments for cancer, and there's so many new, new, new approaches now coming out of this uh, for cancer. We can get the liver to make an antibody, 
We can do CAR T cell, CAR -T -cell uh, therapy, you know, in vivo CAR T to try to eliminate the cancer, uh, and that's also the potential for cancer vaccine. So it's really a revolution uh, in medicine uh, that we're about about to uh, about, about to uh, see. That's highly specific, highly personalized, and be developed very rapidly in times on the order of two or three months. So it's a big change. So this is. Uh, this is uh, the, the, the future, uh, really, as I said, quite remarkable in terms of the range of opportunity and uh, being able to tackle in a fundamental way uh, diseases that we really couldn't, um, we really couldn't go after uh, in a, uh, an intelligent manner before. So, so the, the, what I've covered here is really the work of, I mean, literally hundreds, if not uh, more, uh, people. Um, the, uh, the, one of the things I benefited from, as I tried to emphasize at the beginning, is really long-term associ association with my associates. Uh, we started off a company in uh, 1992 uh, with uh, you know, four, four postdocs, uh, or four people who have been postdocs in my laboratory. Uh, we're still working together today. Um, and this is people like Mick Hope, Tom Madden, Etc. And uh, you know, others that uh, 20 years or more: Steve Ansel, Ying Tam, uh, <coughs> Sron Semple, uh, Barb, etc. Uh, people at Al Nilem. The, the Nilem collaboration was uh, enormously formative in this uh, in this work. These things work in the brain, as uh, as Drew was indicating. Uh, working with Drew has been a has been revolutionary for us. Uh, the uh, and then my own lab uh, <coughs> in the biochemistry department at Oxford. So it's a, a biochemistry department at UBC. So, so it's a, this is a, uh, <clears throat> it's been a, real, it's been a real honor to be here and to receive the uh, Tang Prize. I think the, um, you know, what we all have to say here is that it's this, in terms of the, uh, the, the pharmaceutical applications uh, that are being realized, uh, in addition to uh, the impact uh, that uh, the vaccine has made, you know, this is really, really is a big change in medicine and one that we're all hastening to exploit as best we can, uh, but it's really going to change the world in terms of the therapeutic uh, potentials. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you very much to Professor Collis for your speech. Please take your seat. Thank you. And finally, we would like to invite back to the stage Professor Wang to give us the conclusion. Welcome. Wow, it's uh, really exciting to hear all, all three speakers talking about uh, their, well, original uh, goals and what they achieved and what uh, the futures will look like. And uh, since this is a 2022 uh, Time Prize laureates, and during our committee meetings, of course, uh, we uh, review many, many uh, submissions, and finally we uh, chose uh, those, these three uh, laureates uh, for the following reason. Here's our citation. It says, uh, for the discovery of key vaccinology concepts and approaches leading to the successful development of mRNA-based COVID-19 vaccine. So at that time, we cited uh, specifically on COVID-19. Uh, however, today's uh, lecture uh, gave us uh, this uh, future perspectives of many, many application of this uh, mRNA LMP uh, technology platforms. It can be used uh, to counter uh, infectious diseases, chronic diseases, cancers, and many others. So this is truly an exciting uh, pr perspective for us. Now, of course, uh, let me just say this contribution, uh, I will phrase one of the nominators. It says, no other recent scientific discovery had a higher and more positive impact on humans than the COVID-19 mRNA vaccine. Now, of course, in the future, we 
uh, can expect that uh, many, many other applications will come forward. But uh, today, uh, the three laureates all have their stories, and I think I want to say a few words about them. <clears throat> For our young scientists, you see, all three of them have their unique stories. Uh, for Dr. Carrico, uh, as you have heard, she has encountered many troubles over her career. Over the 40 years, she has been dismissed, uh, demoted, and lost the jobs, and so on. However, she persists uh, her interest and continue the research in this area. And then when I look at uh, her CV, you know, before 2021, she obtained a few awards. But since 2021, each year in 2021 and 2022, each year she had uh, earned more than 30 awards a year. So it's a step function. Huh? Uh, so you can see that uh, for young scientists, uh, if you are uh, in trouble or depressed, don't give up, uh, just continue. Now for Dr. Weissman, of course, uh, she is, he is a uh, successful model for us, but nonetheless, uh, you have heard that uh, when he started uh, of, about his mRNA ideas and related things to some of his seniors, they smile and then politely says, oh, that's a good story but uh, don't do that, you know? So, so that's another example that uh, if you wanna to be successful, mm, stick to your ideas, to your imagination, but continue, okay? And finally, Peter uh, Kulis uh, is a physicist. And, and he said, uh, when he started, he knew nothing about biochemistry, just like me, huh? And uh, so, uh, but uh, a physicist, you, they have a lot of talents, but uh, what do you do to apply your talents to different things? Fortunately for us, uh, he chose uh, this fat, the, the lipid, I mean, uh, to, to, uh, to study and develop this wonderful technology of uh, LMP, which makes uh, the successful uh, story of not only this COVID-19 mRNA vaccines, but I'm sure in the future for other uh, uh, stories as well. So uh, for young scientists, I think you can learn from this. In Peter's case, uh, he, uh, it's an interdisciplinary application of your mind. And uh, but when you are down and out, don't give up. You know, th those are the kind of lesson I learned myself, okay. Now, of course, uh, term price, uh, we, in, especially in the biopharmaceutical area, because this is a, uh, the area that only Lombard Price has. Huh? So we are pretty successful in terms of uh, the price leading to the, the ultimate Nobel Prize. So I'm sure they are being considered in Stockholm right now. And uh, I wish them luck. Perhaps in two months, we will hear that uh, they will go to Stockholm for their next prize. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Professor Wong for the inspiring conclusion. And thank you once again to our laureates, Professor Carrico, Professor Wiseman, and Professor Collis. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes the laureate lecture for biopharmaceutical science. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Please don't forget your personal belongings as you leave, and we wish you a good day. 各位来宾，第五届唐奖得奖人演讲《生机医药厂》到这边圆满告一个段落。非常感谢您今天的参与，希望大家都有满满的收获。离场的时候，请记得您随身携带的物品，并且归还您所借取的同步口译接收器，取回您的证件。谢谢各位，也祝福各位平安顺心。